There's no place to escape to. This is the last time. Oh, yes. On the left. <laughs> That's when the cannibalism started. We don't do that. We're I don't radio smell. professionals. You know? No, what are you talking about? We're You're radio, radio professionals. <laughs> he was made in the lab, but was, we're radio professionals. We're radio I professionals. Am, are we recording? Yeah, made we were, in a lab. Gil Deray. It's Gilles. actually G. Well, we have no, to do a whole, I get it all oh, over no. the place. Oh no, I get it all Wait, over the place. Wait, we got the name wrong. Because then I heard that not only we not not only is it not <sighs> Gilles, it is Gilles, but actually Gilles. I've heard that you're supposed to add the S too. No, that doesn't make any sense. Oh, they don't no, say guys. whatever they. One. That doesn't make any sense that they, you would add the S because every other fucking French pronunciation thing that I've been told has been okay. totally and completely wrong. That's what not, did, it's like, it's like, oh yeah, G-I-L-L-E-S. What's that supposed to be? Oh, G. G Gilles. Gilles. It's Gills, technically. But <laughs> what, did, Gilles. what did Gilles. the hottest women, woman that you guys researched say it as? Gilles. Gilles it is. Okay, so we're going as Gilles Duray. I That's keep it the as metric. Gilles. Yeah. I mean, but I really wanted to introduce the audience to the fact that right before we began, Marcus yeah. dared to say, dared to say, wow, that wow. the microphone cover, me, Henry Zaprowski, yeah. made in a lab <laughs> to be a You're really taking that AI created men's health article seriously. All of my memories are not real. They were put inside of my brain by the guy that is the nutritionist for Will Smith. Oh, I can't wait for Universal Soldier 3 podcaster. Podcaster is <laughs> just a man born in a rolly chair. Uh, you said that my microphone cover stank. Your microphone it cover, did. it stank. And then you dare to say, because I'm a fervent performer. Uh -huh. I am the Billy Mays <laughs> of this show. And then you're saying that it's because of my performance style. It's the spit. Uh -huh. it's, it's just the, the spit. spit. It it's, stays on there. It's the incredible amount of spit that both you and Holden McNeely <laughs> produce when you perform on a podcast. Live because performers. You're both live. You're our theater performers. Right. You, the, you ain't spitting. You ain't acting. The spit guard that Holden McNeely <laughs> I uses, I, actually, I had to use it the other day. I accidentally sniffed it, and I seriously, I gagged. He gagged. How do you I, think his fucking wife feels? Well, we don't <laughs> want do to talk about that. How do you think his child that. feels? Welcome <laughs> to the last podcast on the left, everyone. Ben hanging out with Marcus, and of course, Henry. I am really excited to get to this episode. I think oh, there's oh, going to so be the, a lot of blood. The child murder, that's what you're excited for? Uh -huh. No, I'm excited to learn more about a mer No, world! History. Yeah. Isn't that exciting? And Marcus, I hope you tie it back a little bit to America because I heard some theories being kicked around in the kitchen last night. Marcus yeah. has his own version of a red-eyed 3 a.m. <laughs> deep, deep rabbit hole. I, 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 love think it. it's, I, I think it's very good. Man, if you like just think about it for like a you second. Just put like, your perspective goggles on for a second. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Whoa, that's a weird goggle. Yeah, I fucking see it now, bro. All right, Gilles Deray, part two. All right, so we're going. Part with two. So we're going. <laughs> we're going with the most with the most beautiful woman pronounced it as because that's our best chance. When you meet a beautiful woman, we assume they all talk with each other and they all go by Gilles. All right. Also, I think Gilles Gilles is if you're a lady. Gilles. Oh, I'm having a date with Gilles. Gilles is as opposed over to G, who sounds like he should be I don't know fluffing your underwear. Or but something. it does sound like oh, unfortunately for some reason Gilles cut our date off tonight because he wanted to meet my daughter. <laughs> oh my goodness. Let's Let's get on with it. So when we last left Gilles de Ray, he and Joan of Arc were on their way to the French city of Orléans to free it from the hated English in one of the pivotal battles in the third phase of the Hundred Years' War. And I actually, I was thinking about this earlier. Our, this series will probably, at the end, be close to like nine and a half hours long, <laughs> spread out over several periods. Yeah. So this entire series is very similar to the Hundred Years' War. Indeed. Which was, of course, 116 years <laughs> over three distinct periods. And I won't <laughs> ever yeah. let anyone ever once forget that. Very good. And for the first part of this episode, Gilles de Ray will seemingly be somewhat of a footnote of history. Mm. But as we shall see, Gilles is a far larger part of the pie than what he's made out to be by certain biographers. Ooh, Ooh, interesting. How shade. shade. 
Put another way, it is absolutely fascinating to see such an evil human being such as Gilles de Rey playing sidecar to one of the most revered people in history. It's like if John Wayne Gacy had been JFK's chief of staff. It's true. Yeah. Because this episode, as we get to the latter half of this episode, is the John Wayne Gacy portion of Gilles de Rey's life. Okay. This is how we compare him because we've been covering him a little bit. You know, when, well, last time we called him Ted Bundy meets Harvey Weinstein meets Jared Fogel. Ooh. So this is like... He is somewhere between it. This is the Jared Fogel sandwich oh. lord okay. like time period where, you know, because what are you going to do with all that sandwich money? Absolutely. You've got to do something with it, like destroy your entire lives and the lives of people around you. Yes. Yeah. But concerning the Battle of Orleans, French commanders believed that French forces were going to arrive at Orleans for a long siege because the English were well fortified and had no reason to come out and fight. The idea of a siege, however, did not please Joan of Arc. Hmm. As we're about to see, Joan was a woman of action, for better or for worse, during her short time as a commander in the French army. And that quality would both contribute to her fame and lead to her demise. Okay. Do you think that Greta Thornburg might be more, like, you know, hear me out on this. Yeah, she sure. might be more effective if she had weaponry. <laughs> I mean, I think <laughs> that would probably weaponry. help. I could see her with a big-ass sword, with a gun. I think if she came to America and acclimated to our gun culture, she, she would be the number one spokesperson for the NRA, her and Dana Loesch, in like a month. This mm -hmm. is what to do, right? Combine, right? Get controversial. Start of the show, right? Combine love of guns for love of the planet Earth. So we say, like, we fight pollution with these bullets Great. in a way by taking over various, you know, giant corporate buildings. Mm -hmm. Greta Thornburg with a pack of her Twitter people who arrive, mm -hmm. right? Like right. in a January 6th. You say style this thing. like it hasn't happened. Already. Yeah, you're saying this like Ted Kaczynski didn't exist. Good well, but he didn't like really. So crush Ted Kaczynski apologized. <laughs> he didn't land Henry Zabrowski. He didn't land if I'm Randy Kraft's he number one fan, <laughs> if I'm Randy Kraft's number one fan, you are Ted Kaczynski's number one fan as well. I'm Ted Kaczynski's. Honestly, I wish I was Ted Kaczynski's editor because he needed to live. <laughs> someone needed to come in with a red pen. Yeah, that's true. Well, Joan, she figured that when she arrived to Orlean, her men were well fed and morale was high. So what better time to attack than immediately Damn. while God was still on everyone's side? God's here now, man. <laughs> Sweet, but God will flip at any moment. Any he, moment. He will. That's why you got to act now. Absolutely. The problem was that the Loire River was too low. Hmm. Therefore, the French army couldn't send barges full of heavily armored men across. Hmm. But miraculously, as it would happen often with Joan of Arc, as it's put down in historical record, the wind changed oh. and the water level rose, making the crossing not only possible, but almost incontestable because of the seemingly divine <laughs> circumstance. And isn't that something that meteorology has taken away from us? Because now we're like, mm, weather patterns, cyclone <laughs> bomb, cyclone coming. But before it was just like, that's an act of fucking God. Yeah. yeah and like, that's so much more fun. But Jeanne de Pousset. As she's known as well. She <laughs> oh, wow. had a lot of uh, she had a lot of weird, mysterious circumstances, okay. which you'll go pl play on later on in life when they did the entire like fabrication of making her a saint. Like mm -hmm. what all of yeah. the lies that everyone had to say to the church to make her a saint. But that was because everyone was mad at her. We'll see what happens to her in this episode. I mean, also weather does change. Yeah, so weather just does a, change. A bit of luck can change a lot of fortune. It really can. And Joan had a lot of luck a lot of the time. Okay. But she entered Orlean to meet an excited populace, while Gilles de Rey returned to the city of Blois for more supplies. Mm -hmm. Now, get more croissants. <laughs> you gotta get foie gras. They gotta get a couple of house wines. Yeah. You gotta, and then you gotta stop smoking a cigarette. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's hard to do. It's a long running errands in France is a long process. <laughs> I love a good house wine. <laughs> Now, Joan's reputation had preceded her, and when she entered the city, people lost their minds because this was pretty much as close as they were ever going to get to meeting an angel on Earth. Wow. This, however, was only in the outer ring of the city, mm -hmm. as the English fortifications were deeper in. Sure, yeah, always. So, well... <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, the English fortifications are always real deep. Real deep. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so while the more experienced commanders had taken Joan's lead in at least entering Orlean, they refused to attack the English fortifications until Gilles de Rey returned with supplies. Hmm. And so Joan toured the English battlements and called on them to surrender to her and God. She just roasted them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so she just went on like a mini tour. Yeah. Well, it's touring the battlements, meaning she walked around and she said, fuck yeah, come out. 
Come on, God is here. God is here. God, the God's sword shall strike you down. Sweet. My hymen's the strongest hymen in Europe. <laughs> strongest hymen of all time. Her hymen was so strong it broke the horse's back. <laughs> <laughs> Who's made in a lab? <laughs> oh, made in a lab. <laughs> what do you think the English said back? I think some of the peasants who were suffering from the English oligarchs were very happy to see her. But then I would assume some of the more successful folks were quite scared she was going to destabilize the entire regime. <laughs> no, they did it the old-fashioned English way by calling her a whore. Oh, okay, gotcha, <laughs> yeah. gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Bitch, they called her that a lot. They called, Cowgirl was what they called her. Okay. A lot, which I would imagine it's a pejorative depending on which, the, you know, well, where the emphasis peasant. is. Yeah. It's probably saying because you're like a peasant and you, you know, yeah. that style of thing. But yeah. now we know cowgirls. I mean, that's how I get onto the airplane first, because as you guys know, I suffer from little cowgirl syndrome. And it actually takes me a long time to get down the aisle because every yes. time I go, I'll go, howdy, mister. Howdy, howdy mister. Yeah, of course. Howdy, mister. And it takes me fucking 45 minutes. I so know. That's why I get on the plane ahead you, of soldiers. You always get to pre-board. <laughs> that's right. But even so, Joan kept touring the battlements day after day, waiting for Gilles to return, absorbing the misogynistic insults from the English. Hmm. On the fifth day, though, Joan said that the quote unquote voices told her that it was time to attack the English somewhere in Orleans, anywhere, just so long as she attacked. OK. Supposedly, at that moment, Joan saw the smoke and heard the sounds of a medieval battle elsewhere in the city. Whoa. So she rode out to get her first taste of true hand-to-hand -hand combat. This is the first time she's wow. ever in battle. She's... She just jumps in. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'll must, give her that credit yeah. for all of the lack Always. of planning and kind of the impulsive nature of her work. And maybe some would say like lack of foresight. She just would jump right fucking in in front of everybody else. And she was, I think, 16, 17 years yeah, old. 16, well, 17, about 5'1", five, 5'2". Five, but that a, was average at the time. She's it, nuts, man. It's a great message. Reminds me of Molly Shannon and Superstar. You got to put your hands under your armpits and jump right in the deep end. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic film. <laughs> I mean, yeah, one day it will one day it'll receive its due. Yeah. Well, when Joan got there, she found that the fight had been started by some very enthusiastic French citizens who'd been inspired to take matters into their own hands. Because that's the hold, hold, hold. <laughs> yeah. And then you know some guys like, fuck it. And he just throws a pot in that like a dude, and all of a sudden he starts World War Three. Yeah. That could happen. But since Joan rode out with no plan whatsoever, she soon found herself trapped between two fires facing certain death. <laughs> but at that moment, who should ride out to Saint Lou, fresh from returning with supplies, but Gilles de Ray and friends? Mon ami, I have brought bread. <laughs> wow, he's got some friends with him. Very cool, like Thundercats. Yeah, he paid a lot of those friends to hang around. You'd be surprised how That's much fine. of these entourages you see on television are actually sponsored by capitalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's fine, though. Even if you're paying them, then you're, they're actually better friends than if you're not paying them. That's true, because then they have yeah. a reason to stay. Absolutely. Yeah. But then their loyalty is always, all, it's always dependent on how much you're paying them. Just don't so lose any money. <laughs> don't lose your money. <laughs> that's the key. <laughs> that's the key, of yeah. course. Now, Joan didn't like directly shedding blood herself, but the sight of her banners and her white armor pushed the French forces onward to take the Bastille of saint Lou. They did nice. it. Nice. Likewise, the English were superstitious enough where just the sight of Joan in her finest in the midst of battle was enough to throw them off their game. It's what Dan Carlin calls the X Factor. Wow. The X Factor. I love that show. The X Factor. And so... After scaling the walls and fighting man to man with sword, axe, mace, and war hammer, Whoa. the French it's killed. Sweet. It's my yeah. favorite, dude. Yeah, the war hammer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I'm playing Skyrim right now, and I'm using that hammer, man. The yeah. war hammer. <laughs> yeah. The French killed 140 Englishmen. They captured 40 more, and they set the fortifications on fire. On fire. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of with you. I also really like an aggressive, defensive weapon, like a sharp sword or something like that. Or, I mean, it's a sharp um, shield. shield. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah I like also... Oof, hit him with that. I prefer, like, things that are attached also to armaments and to holds. Like, the yeah. idea of, like, big boiling pots of oil. Oh, mm -hmm. fantastic. I think that's really yeah. fucking yeah. cool. Yeah. Throwing burning barrels of Donkey Kong-style defense. I agree. Yeah. Is what I prefer. That's what I do at my home. Yeah. That's what the burglars need to know if you come for me. <laughs> I plan to right. literally spray you with the sticky-like goop yeah. to right. keep you pinned to things and, and that pin night, you down. And what's so nice is all that oil can later be used for your deep frying. Yes. <laughs> it's nice. Yes. I'm a halberd type guy. I like a real good halberd because you can what's do a halberd? A halberd is like a, weapon. Yeah, it's like a lance-like oh. weapon. It's got a big blade on the end of it. Love it. You can use 
use it a lot of different ways. Cool. There's a lot of different strategies you can use. You the can butt use to get some distance, get some distance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can and use, use it as thick. The yeah, stick, too. You can hit your, your, your buddy with it, too. Yeah, it's a crotch. And it got your dick. Yeah, and at the end of the day, you can still use it as a really long axe. Cool. Whatever happened to that show that talked about weapons? Anyway, let's move on. Oh, the guy from, um. oh, I know what you're talking about. There was a show George R. or George Lee Ermey. It was great. Yeah, it was. It was really interesting. Well, in other words. All right. Joan of Arc's first battle was indeed a massive victory, Woo! but it had come with a big assist from Gilles de Rais. And this would not even be close to the last time that Gilles de Rais would save Joan of Arc's life. And that's what's interesting about his place in history. Okay, here it begins. Is this yeah, it? Yeah. This begins. Yeah. This is, you know, like, we're just going to go with Marcus on this. I do think it's, it is interesting. It's compelling. Compelling, yeah. yeah. You can't spell revisionary history without visionary. <laughs> visionary. <laughs> See, DeRay biographers swear up and down that there is documentation to back up the claim that DeRay was Joan's savior during her more rash combat decisions, especially in her early battles. But reading accounts from the perspective of Joan of Arc biographers, mm. Gilles is nowhere to be found. Maybe because he was one of the world's biggest child molesters and child murderers, and then you get attached to her shit, and the, the people are like, well, people like her. Jean de Bucille. Yeah. They like right. her, and mm -hmm. this is going to affect her testing. Yes. Gotcha. In both biographies, they share people like Jean de Dunois, uh -huh. but... But Gilles is wiped from Joan's history altogether. And that, a whippity wipe. <laughs> That's not right, though. It's inaccurate history. Well, that to me is extremely interesting because had it not been for Gilles de Rey, Joan of Arc would have likely been killed in her first battle, oh, yeah, which no. would have had massive ramifications on the course of world history. Mm. See, if Joan of Arc had been killed in that first battle, she would not have been seen as a hero. No. Rather, she would have been seen as a massively stupid misstep on the part of Dauphin Charles VII. Absolutely. He sent a 16-year-old girl to be killed in war. She yeah. said she was talking to angels, right. and now she's really talking to angels because I put a fucking pike in her head. Uh -huh. Explain <laughs> that. Yeah, Charles was fighting not only the English and and the Burgundians, but he was also fighting for the very right to be crowned king. He was hanging on by a thread. Then yeah. he just hands over a section of his army to a religious teenage weirdo who just kind of showed up. And without Gilles de Rais, mm -hmm. that weirdo would have gotten killed immediately. And of course, with the Burgundians, a very easy group to kill, they were only wearing corduroy. Mm. Why does that have to do? What? Yeah, huh? why does that slow you down? Because you can stab right through corduroy. <laughs> it's not very protective. But what what about Burgundy makes you? No, think they're the Burgundians. <laughs> they wear corduroy. I mean, when I think of corduroy, actually, bur Burgundy is usually the color of corduroy. I don't know why that's true, but it is. Mustard? It is. Green. I'm just saying the Bur if, oh my god, Gene, a standard denim corduroy does exist. The Burgundians, Tab. the Burgundians are coming. The Bur oh, don't worry, they're walking the wrong way. <laughs> It, the Burgundians? I'm just not scared of the Burgundians. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, go on. Well, had that happened, had Joan of Arc been killed in that first battle, then it's likely that Joan of Arc would have been seen in the historical record as not a master stroke of strategy, but as a capricious decision of decadence on the part of an illegitimate ruler. Mm, Charles, crucial mistake. Charles mm. VII probably would have thereafter been deposed. And since Joan of Arc's presence was the turning point in the Hundred Years' War, France would have probably fallen under the rule of the English. Had France become basically English territory yep. or at least English allies, then 300 years later, there would have been nobody to bail out the Americans during the Revolution of 1776. Uh -huh. Because without France, French assistance, we would not have won. Therefore, it is my contention uh, okay. that without Gilles de Rey, the United yep. States of America would uh, not exist. Wow. <laughs> that where my father's not uh -huh. land of mm -hmm. the pilgrim's pride. None of that. No. None of that. <laughs> no Super Bowl. No Super no Bowl. No fried chicken. Oh my no, God. No yas. <laughs> there would be no, what else America bring? Uh, no everything. Jazz. bombs. <laughs> Music. No giant space-bound surveillance system Television. that's keeping us all in play. <laughs> well, wow. at best, the United States would have instead been born of a second go at revolution in 1884. Interesting. There, the point of contention would not have been taxation without representation, but rather the legality of slavery in British colonies. Starting to think he was made in the lab. I'm starting to think he might have been. <laughs> he was been. the lab guy. But this is interesting because I'm certain, Actually, obviously. it's not 1884, it's 1834. Excuse well, me. Oh, I mean, 1834. Oh, oh, oh. We were just about to get the emails. We just I, avoided. I know. Yeah, well, that's the thing. It would make sense for it to be 1884 because that would have been long after the American Civil War and the British, of course, abol uh, uh, ab 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 abolitionized, abolitionized, abolished slavery Very good. many years before America did. Well, okay. I certain, I'm certain that, because um, what do I know about history topics? 
There are people that <laughs> have, fucking lay it on me, bro. Um, they have a <laughs> sort of uh, how do you put it? Almost a, how do you uh, how do you put this generally? An irrational attachment to things that have happened thousands of years ago. Mm-hmm. It's in a very long time of history, it's but hundreds they, of years ago. But it's like the way they view it, right? Is that sometimes historians they're caught in their little time period, right? Because mm-hmm. a lot of times they dress like it. Yeah, they're completely isolated a lot of times, themselves yeah, in modern a lot of times. times. Yeah, a lot yeah. of times. A, lo- a lot of the French historians I've seen they dress like it's you know fifteen forty three. They always do. A lot of Jodkins, big hats with feathers in them. Jerkins. Yeah, yeah, all that kind of shit. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm certain there's no way your alternative history take is going to rile any of those guys nah. up. They never. There's no way you're going to get the musket heads out no. uh, yeah. in full force. Guess what? I don't read social media or emails, Boom. so I'm not going to hear about he it. He doesn't Immune. care. He doesn't care. <laughs> yeah. But, no, I do, but I think that's very interesting. It's just more showing that his position in history yes. is fucking wild. Huge. Like I mean, he was this guy was like a part of like you know, je ne peux faire was one as mm-hmm. you put one of the most famous human beings mm-hmm. on the face of in in, in history. He yeah. wouldn't be the first child murderer to save this fine republic of ours. <laughs> <laughs> no, not the first. The list is quite long. <laughs> Okay. Well, I do appreciate everyone's indulgence and my interest in alternative history. <laughs> we're we're, forced, we're thank you. forced to be thank, here. Thank you. Thank you for your indulgence, sir. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. I loved it. I mean, uh, I think it's thank fascinating. You. What if we just fought you and screamed like, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. It's the opposite of comedy. Yeah. Let's get back to Gilles de Ray and yes. Joan of Arc oh, at wow. the Siege of Orleans. Whoa, it's like we never left. So on the day of Joan's first victory, she sent a letter to the English shot on the end of an arrow, telling them to again surrender. Cool. That's but awesome. Of course, all they replied with was another unimaginative hurl of the word whore. Mm. Now, perhaps... Did they really... What was the word? Was it whore? Whore, yeah. Oh, yeah, they yeah, were yeah just, it's whore. It's been yeah. around that long? Yeah, whore's been around yeah, long. Wow. That word, it would be the word for it would be like, le No, it was the English saying it to her. So they just so said, said the word been, whore. Yeah, but they just didn't have a W on it. Oh. Oh. oh, yeah. <laughs> I see. Yeah, so you think that they're stuck on a boat in the middle of the ocean, <laughs> gotcha. but actually they're hurling insults. Yeah. Really good. Now, perhaps because they were yucking her yum on the day of her first victory, or because, or because, <laughs> what are you saying? Where are you getting? At? I learned that from you. Just a group of people screaming whore at you. That meaning it's yucking your yum. You're yucking it's my yum. Funny. But this is after she won the battle, right? It's her first battle, her first victory. Yeah, so yeah. This is like guys, not now, guys. Yeah, no, this is a compliment. You don't want your enemy to uh, be happy with you. This is awesome. They're upset. They're mm. riled. Yeah. Who cares if they're calling her a whore? She just beat the fuck out of them. Well, per- also. It might also be because she's a fucking 16 year old who yeah. just survived a medieval hand to hand battle, yeah. almost died. Uh, she did. She broke down in tears. I mean, it, it, of got, course. it got to her just a okay, little bit. Okay. Which just also in, in that way, like it, it humanized her to even yeah. her own people. She was very beloved. To yeah, her she time. was. Yeah. And the only reason why I mentioned that is because once because she was sort of out of the picture for a little bit dealing with her bullshit. A commander, well, not bullshit, but dealing with her own thing. emotions. Emotions. No, believe me, yeah. I have said the word <laughs> bullshit, a, a, referring to my emotions, emotions in therapy. As have to I. To the point where my therapist did say this last time, being like, well, you don't like to sort of meet your emotions. You don't like to enjoy it. And I was like, fuck you. <laughs> right. Oh, I don't. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. I fucking don't. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, yeah. So, yeah. But when I say bullshit, it's not a pejorative for someone else's emotions. It's just how I refer to my own. And it spills over sometimes. It does. Fantastic. <laughs> But because of Joan's breakdown, a commander named Dunois and Gilles de Ray had a meeting without Joan in which it was decided to pause the attacks and fortify their positions. But even though those decisions were made, Joan had the bad habit of saying, fuck the commanders, I'm going to do what I want. Okay. Zendaya. <laughs> that's your, your only reference of anyone under the age of 30. Well, Sydney Sweeney, but that's only because of her boobs. And Who's she's that? young, young. She was in that Euphoria show, but she's very, she, oh, she's got, she's got she, boobs. Is she, she over, she's good, she's she's over 18. Actor. She's yeah. over 18. Yeah, right? of course. Okay, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. okay. Well, the next day. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only other one I know. Great. Zendaya. Zendaya. Yes. Good, good. Well, the next day, Joan crossed back over the river Loire with her men to attack the English in the town of Les Augustines. So she just went, one day licked her wounds and then went on to another battle. Yeah. Wow. The English safely returned to their fortifications and Joan's army began to falter. But once again, Joan was saved by Gilles de Ray, who helped her take Les Augustines while killing a hell of a lot of English. And he wow. loved it. Yes. Yeah. He loved it. Every moment. But while it might seem like Gilles would have become annoyed about having to save Joan again and again, he actually, he kind of loved her spirit. 
because he was also reckless and he was also impulsive. And it seemed like wherever Joan went, the bloodshed that Gilles so craved always seemed to follow. He very much liked the fact that she just wanted to fuck everything up. Yeah. Yeah. Even though she didn't fuck anything up herself, no. she was very good at whipping up others to fuck things up for her. Gotcha. But the other thing about Gilles and Joan is that I think he was just as swept up in Joan's magical aura as everyone else, but not in the same way. See, he saw that she had seemingly divine powers of foresight and inspiration, which fed into Gilles' belief in God. This, however, would later translate into practices that would have horrified Joan of Arc. Or at least I'd hope so. Yes. Instead yeah. of seeing that God is real, therefore I must obey his rules, Gilles reasoned that if God was real, <laughs> so was Satan. Satan! Satan! Whoa. Satan! And if God could help Joan, then Satan could help Gilles. He always Ooh, does. Ooh, isn't that does. nice? Well, not really. Sometimes it leads to horrible YouTube videos, bad clothing, bad lifestyle choices, and overall loneliness. Mm. <laughs> Satanism? <laughs> um, yeah, it's true. No, it's true. Uh, but I also think that uh, because later on, his magical proclivities will also speak to the fact that he does somewhat, something in here cemented yeah. that yeah. all this shit's real. Yes. Because you also see it come up again in his trial because with the, one of the main bones of contention in his trial was how quickly he turned on, the, the, like he went from saying I'm innocent to confessing, which is that a, a seemed to be a late in life obsession with his fate of his soul yeah. in uh. the eyes of God might have changed things as well because it might harken back to, oh, fuck, that's right. That one time God was real. <laughs> right. Okay. Fly from your grave. Now, on May 7th, the day after Gilles and Joan took Les Augustin, mm, Joan's An island only occupied by ducks. L an island only... Joan's luck... <laughs> <laughs> See, I mean, it makes sense if it was called, like, Quackerton. <laughs> you know, or, like, like Web to Webby Town. <laughs> sounds like Quackerton to me. But Augustin. Augustin. That sounds like a duck quack, island quack. to you. Oh, my God, we must be close. You're just making, <laughs> you're just making bird noises. Yeah. You can't just make bird noises. Yeah, yeah but, it's a go but it would be an island of gooses, He's right? already done the geese. goose. No, I've already done the goose. Yeah. <laughs> and hung, hung. <laughs> Well, anyway, that's where Joan's luck hit a bump in the road. Mm. She was shot with an arrow in the shoulder while trying to place a ladder against English fortification walls at Les Tourelles. But she was caught and removed from battle by, again, Gilles de Ray. Yeah, That's man. all real? That is, well, according to Gilles de Ray's people. So what okay. we know about all of these things, right, like most of the reason why we know so much about these people's lives are because of the trials that both went through. Joan uh -huh. of Arc's trial was extremely, it was long. Six months. It was a Jesus. lot of shit, and it was heavily documented. Same yeah. thing with Gilles de Ray's trial. So, and you're basically listening to their people's version of these stories, and then Got historians you. are trying to kind of all triangulate where do they all touch tips, right? Where do right, they all, right. like, come mm -hmm. together as one? And it seems that more people agreed than not that Gilles de Ray was always like, wherever Joan of Arc, Gilles de Ray was like right there wow, working as that's well. That's awesome. All right. Very cool. Well, her wounds were dressed with lard and olive oil. Then both of them returned to battle. That's how you know she's French. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they made a yeah. recipe to fucking to cure her bullshit. <laughs> yeah. That's like the uh, put some tussin on it. Put yeah. some tussin on it. Yeah. Put Chris some, Rock. Put some lard on it. Yeah. There, Joan led the French forces through the English defenses. Whilst fighting in a vineyard, Joan called out, quote, Watch and see. When the tip of my standard touches the English defense walls. Soon she heard a man call out, Joan, the tip is touching. <laughs> Whoa. And with the call that the tip had touched, <laughs> jo Joan commanded her men. Everyone jump. To Everyone do the Harlem shake. Oh. <laughs> no, she commanded them to enter the fort. Whoa, the tips have touched. Now it's time to enter the fort. And in a burst of energy, both the army and the French townspeople overwhelmed the English. The defeated English forces then tried retreating across the bridge, but were thwarted when a flaming barge floated by a fisherman collapsed the structure, yes. drowning most of the 400-some-odd Englishmen dressed in full armor. This is like my type of asymmetrical warfare. Yeah. I love that type of shit, where yeah. it's just like you turn an everyday object into something that's like highly fucking chaotic, yeah. and everybody freaks out. Sure. Were you at the Boston Marathon, buddy? <laughs> no. Oh, okay. I was watching from a building with binoculars. Oh, straight. Are you allowed to buy crackpots? 
By the next day, the English began leaving the city and tearing down their encampments. And on May 8th, the French had successfully retaken Orleans from the English using the inspiration of Joan of Arc and her number one a guy, Gilles de Ray. That's you are <laughs> my number one a guy. Oh. I love the way you're touching me. <laughs> I love it. I'd say more of a supporting act. He's a, He was her supporting act the entire time. Sure. Yeah. Well, he was he's the, the fucking muscle. Yeah. He's the Sam to her Frodo. Sure. Yeah, actually, that's cool. That's close. Yeah, that works. Yeah, that, that 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 does kind of work. Yes, yeah, indeed. yeah. If you can't carry it, I'll, I'll carry you. Share the load. <laughs> and then they did. <laughs> yeah, they did. <laughs> the deleted scenes. But once Orlean was taken, it became obvious that the French had a problem. Hmm. Joan and Gilles had become quite close, but both of them were anti-authoritarian, albeit with different motivations. Mm. Joan believed herself answerable only to God, while Gilles was answerable only to his own desires. And now we have that all together on the Supreme Court. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but even so, Gilles was an obviously talented commander and warrior, so he was appointed the position of Marshal of France. Yeah. Okay. And the marshals of France are very fancy. Oh, mm -hmm. you want to be the mar? I want to be. Yeah. That I means I was going to make a joke, but oh, it's a name. That's what <laughs> I was trying to. I actually yeah. was kind of. I'm kind of disappointed. Yeah. No, both of that us. You totally. didn't. We, we, no, we, I yeah, started it. I thought that you were going to say something it about. Up, yeah. Yeah. That's a double whiff there. That's a double whiff. It doesn't sound like we were made in a lab at all, does it? <laughs> All this is going to be cut. We're just going to have to lift every single bit of this evidence that well, we are human. I've listened to episodes, and it seems every time you say that, it stays in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's almost like... Way to sabotage yeah, 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 sure, sure. sure no, but again, fun. I appreciate the calls coming from inside the house. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah. Well, the Marshal of France, this position, it not only gave Gilles higher pay and privileges, but it made him an officer of the crown. In other words, Gilles de Ray was even more powerful and even more shielded by the establishment than he'd ever been. Oh, yeah, wow. dude. He's with the number one. He's next to the number one that it's becoming the most important force in French politics and in Fran like this in world endeavors. So wow. you wonder why in the end, when they went to go immediately, like what do they call? I, I think they call it rehabilitate Joan of Arc mm. after her trial. Like, and they kind of left Gilles de Ray out for some reason. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they decided that maybe he there was something about him yeah. that nobody really liked. Yeah, it wouldn't help her reputation, I suppose. Not at all. But of course, Gilles de Ray, he is the Marshal of France. You're kind of put, putting him in a corner. You know what to do with Gilles de Ray. Yeah. But no one knew what the fuck to do with Joan of Arc. Oh, yeah, man. Te technically, you know, ooh, this is a bad comparison. But the idea of having somebody that you think that you can control in a position of power, like with Adolf Hitler, right? When mm -hmm. they set him up, they thought originally, oh, this is a guy we can direct around. Yeah. But then he was a he became a fucking maniac and he took over the entire inside of the destruction. We're like, what, what was the era where he wasn't a maniac? Can you talk? Like, <laughs> when, when do you think Hitler was like on to something good? No, I'm just saying that, that it's. It's the concept of like they don't know what to do with this person. Joan of Arc is the Hitler of France. <laughs> no, she's the. I get you're. I, I, I get what he's saying. I get just, what he's saying exactly. I'm just playing gotcha journalism. Yeah, I know. I know. And it just it's everywhere. All well, eyes are on me. I'm sorry for everything. But Joan of Arc again. You're like well, you can't put her in charge because she. We all can't control her because she right. goes off into a closet. And Un so she, predictable. Unpredictable. Absolutely. Totally get it though. Yeah. See, where Charles VII was concerned, Joan, to use a Southern term, she's getting a little too big for her britches. Okay. But even so, as per Joan's visions, Charles VII was crowned King of France about two months after the French retook Orléans in a ceremony that took seven hours. Kill me. Oh, God. <laughs> Consequently, God. Charles... And covered all that stinky-ass oil. Uh, it must have been horrible. Consequently, Charles VII negotiated a 15-day truce with the English and the English's French allies... The Burgundians. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can hear them coming from a mile away. <laughs> Burgundians, here we come here. We go, Burgundians. We're the Burgundians, and there we go. That's the whole song. There's some, we're there was a guy writing an email with a quill right now that is furious. <laughs> yeah, the Burgundians were Someone so powerful. Someone scan my scan this yeah. most it memoriam. Oh, it's the city of America. And they're like, yes. you, are, you are in America, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Is Jeff? 
The My Burgundians. Name is Jeff. The Burgundians <laughs> had their testicles above their penises, as a matter of fact. Uh, not a lot of people understood why. Someone fulfill. Uh, someone go and get my inkwell. <laughs> yes. I must put another uh, strong dysentorian message out to these ooh, these rebellions. Yeah, it was very uh, interesting. Their buttholes were actually where their taint is, and their uh, taint is where their buttholes bring, were... bring me my taller yeah. hat. That gives me confidence. Yeah, Burgundians. <laughs> no, this seriously pissed off Joan, because while she certainly wanted the English out of France, she hated the Burgundians even more. I believe it. She'd held a grudge against the Burgundians since childhood because they sided with the English. Now, as far as how the Burgundians got mixed up with the English, this is basically another Game of Thrones subplot. The Burgundian story is fucking incredible. It's cool. Yeah. yeah. Nice. I mean, the conflict with the Burgundians was somewhat the thrust of the third phase of the Hundred Years' War, in which both Joan of Arc and Gilles de Ray gained their notoriety. See, back in 1407, about 20 years before the <laughs> yes. about 20 years before the crowning of Charles VII, the king regent, Louis I, was murdered in the streets of Paris by 15 masked criminals on the orders of a man named John the Fearless. A king regent, by the way, cool. is the man who acts as the king when the actual king is too young, too sick, or too mentally ill to do so. Okay. Okay, so he's the hand of the right, the hand of the throne, or they call the hand of the king? No. Uh, <laughs> he's a, what would you call that? I'm just trying, I'm just trying no, to reach you. No, I know, I get that. No, 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 in the, in the Game of Thrones world, there were king regents, actually. It's when, um, not the hand of the king, the king regent acts in the king's stead. Like, you know, he's the babysitter of the throne. He uh, babysits the throne with the king's gun. Basically, until the king can become of age and can make decisions on his own. When you say, like, when you had, like, that nine year old uh, King Henry. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They uh, had not, to have a guy come in and he's the one who's acting. But still, every once in a while, that nine year old's like, kill them all. And they're like, all right. Yeah, you still got to do it. Yeah. Now, John the Fearless was the son of the Duke of Burgundy, he of the Burgundians. <laughs> the Duke of Burgundy was named Philip the Bold, and he was angry that royal funds were being spent on Louis I's decadent lifestyle instead of the expansion of French territory. Okay. Understandable. Makes sense. Louis I was acting as king regent because at the time, King Charles VI, Charles VII's father, he was severely schizophrenic. Oh. He believed that he was made of glass and that and he was often unable to remember his name, his wife, or even the fact that he was king. I mean, it is, it is interesting because, yes, obviously he was very ill. But then also Joan of Arc said she was talking to actual full formed angels. Yeah, so, but at least and they did. just gave her an army. But she could still say, hi, my name is Joan. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Be like, actually, uh, you sure? You <laughs> sure? <laughs> I mean, what a day at the kingdom. Be like, oh, no, the king, he thinks he's glass again today. So oh, well. Don't well. put him near windows. He could start a fire. <laughs> give him the, the power yeah. of the sun when it hits glass. And Do you have any cleaner because he says he smudged? <laughs> I yes. need, we yeah, need I, the Windex. He wants to bathe in Windex once again. <laughs> yeah, Please. Louis I, meanwhile, he had been appointed king regent in Charles VI's stead because Louis I was having a sexual affair with the queen. Whoa. Well, that must, wait, what? Isn't it's a is, lot. Again, these are very, you have to see the chart, the family okay, charts. Okay, okay, no, got you. No, no, no. Louis I was fucking the queen. But and the, I thought that was the king. That's not the king. He was fucking the Who's queen. the king? The king, king is Charles VI. The king. The king is Charles VI. You know, these were those episodes these where it's just like, I just see Kissel's English teacher each night going, his, going home and putting the gun in her mouth. Just being oh, yeah. like, this is not the night. <laughs> okay. So, so, I wish it was. Stick with me for the second. For, stick with me All here right, for a second. It. Charles VI is the king. Okay. He, he thinks he's glass. He thinks, he he's, thinks glass. he's glass. Glass king. He cannot fulfill the duties of the king. But They're, he is legally the king and they can't do anything about it. He is legally the king. King. Therefore, his wife, the queen, must appoint someone to act as the king regent. And then she fucks that guy. No, she appoints the guy she is fucking. Yes. There Wait. is a man. Well, then it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But now that guy is also a king. And, so that's not. actually not even cheated. New stepdad Louis is now the king, but in action only. Like he yeah. just shows up in with action the sash only. On. Yeah. And that Got was you. The, but the thing is that this seemed like no one could really figure out. What other reason there could be for Louis first being Louis the first being the king regent because Louis the first was quite unpopular due to something called the Belle des Ardennes. Now this is a very is funny that? story. <laughs> this is back in the day when political gaffes were like more serious. <laughs> You'll yeah. see. Let's go a little bit further back to 1393. Oh, my God. How far are we going to go back? <laughs> we just keep going back. Don't oh, just Lord. Like yeah. He said something about the heat beginning of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> There's a beginning somewhere. In oh, man. 
Before Charles VI was incapacitated, a masquerade ball was thrown in which the king and five nobles performed a dance wearing costumes God, made of linen God, and God, soaked in just, resin. Just reminds me of fucking when we used to go to the uh, Adult Swim up front and you find out they paid Kanye West fucking $2 million to yell at us for 40 minutes and you're just yeah. like, this is what we're spending the money on? We, resin costumes? Mm. I mean, we did watch Drake. He did good. He's, he's he was of, great. Yeah, he was, he was surprisingly good. good. Well, these costumes depicting the nobles as wood savages made them appear shaggy, okay. but it also made them highly flammable. As such, there were strict orders against the lighting of hall torches and strict orders against anyone entering the room with a torch. The idea behind the whole event was to have the audience guess the identities of the wood savages. The mass singer. Yes. Do you remember yes. the blind restaurant? Yes, I do remember yeah, I remember that the all thing the that lights it was all were in the dark, remember, but then yeah. it was all the guys yeah. were the people who served you were blind, so they could yeah. see, but mm -hmm. then but you can't and you don't know what you're eating. Uh -huh. And then it, one person takes off their masks and it's Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> remember that when he was on the mask singer? Oh, I remember, I remember that. that. I remember uh, that. But this is a time period where like uh because who showed this? It was Barry Lyndon. Mm. It re really is beautiful film. Boring this whole fucking God, it's fucking boring. Yeah. But it's a beautiful film that is really illustrates what we've talked about a little bit in the past, where it's like it's it's, think about medieval times is that, you know, you got torches inside and stuff to light. But yeah. those torches create like smoke and like all this stuff. It's, it's gross yeah. now. And so like it, a lot of the times when it was nighttime, it was dark. Wherever <laughs> the fuck you were, it yeah. was dark as fuck like you were. And yeah. it was difficult to see. Yeah. I wonder and if so the they human eyes adjusted a, fun... a little bit. Hmm? I wonder if the human eye adjusted a little bit back then. Do you think they could see better in the dark if it was dark every night? I can see better in the dark all the time. You can see better, I see great in the dark. You can see better in the dark than you can in the light, you think? No, but no. I can still see great in the dark. I, I got can't. really good at nighttime. I, I got really good nighttime right? vision. Why yeah. are you doing that? Why do you purposely get better at nighttime vision? <laughs> yeah, I, <don't> know, <laughs> yeah, I purposely like, get better at nighttime vision. Maybe that was something they gave him in the lab. <laughs> is that, yeah, is that we, a fact? I didn't get that. I, don't, you guys didn't I get hate that. the night. I don't see the night. I don't see that. No, I'm completely blind. I see yeah. wonderfully at night. Okay. Well, yeah, I can walk around in a dark house and not bump my uh, foot at all. He's also British. Is this a whole brag? <laughs> is that a brag? That is a brag. Does he's that British. count as it a brag? It is a brag. Actually, no, he's I don't get. I don't often get to brag about that, but yeah, I'll totally brag about that right now. It's technically a superpower. I have incredible night vision. I just see Caroline is just so scared just like watching Marcus <laughs> do his night vision drills like trying to see what he can she's, see and not see in the night she's just like just put lights on no 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 just put some lights on put the she, lights on she looks at me walk around at night in the pitch darkness with in awe you should ask her she's incredibly impressed with my night vision I think yeah, she, no, knows, I will. she knows that she can't escape I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna ask your wife how in awe she is of you as you can walk around no, at we're night quite, we're, that's how you keep marriages good you're in awe of each other. Yeah, you find an, those oh, things yeah, like, oh my God. Constantly In impressed. Yeah, yeah, constantly. Okay. So we're in this ball. We're in this masquerade ball. All torches are banned. No torches. No torches at all. And everyone's having the quite the annoyingly French twee little Amelie <laughs> time trying to figure out who's who. I do good little pranks. I do good pranks. Okay. Where I go and I fix a piece of lives and they don't know it's me. Mm -hmm. And who should show up drunk bearing a torch but the future king regent? Louis the first. How the oh, fuck you guys no. see this shit in here? <laughs> oh, you no. mean, guys, you guys are all in here. It's fucking dark as shit in here. Let's get out of here. Oh, God. He's just going to Belushi this whole thing, isn't he? Well, accounts differ, but it's said that Louis the first decided to join in on the fun, but hadn't gotten the no torches memo. <laughs> I'm going to go up there and show them all. They're fucking stupid. Are they a bunch of Marcus Parks in there? I can totally see this. <laughs> so he immediately walked in and got the bright idea to just use his torch to win the game. Let's see who's because why the fuck are you in these? Use a fucking torch to stick out there. Stop it, you into this Reggie. It's so funny, it's fucking Reggie. Why did you guys not think of this? I mean, he would, I'd be torch. friends with him. Yeah, I, I think he'd be like, yeah, he's hilarious. Pretty uh, funny. He held the torch above a wood yeah. savage. And these are nobles, by the way. These aren't just like some guy that brought off the street. These are people who count to them. <laughs> yeah. Right. Spark fell, lit the guy on fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The flames spread. Four nobles were killed. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is a political gaffe. This is considered yeah, like yeah. when Dan, Dan Quayle couldn't spell potatoes. <laughs> this is very this is the similar. same equivalent of political death. Yeah, yeah, that is yeah, incredible. He burned four men alive accidentally. I mean, it is his... He can say it, but it's funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, like, no, that's kind of funny, though. But obviously, yeah. King what? Charles was not hurt. No. I feel like that is... He's just like... 
I must be glass. Yeah. <laughs> well, they can't believe. I guess I just turned back to sand. <laughs> what a goddamn hangover that must have been. Because he's probably drinking garbage meat or something that has a really. You guys your all brain. being all awkward. Last night was hilarious. It was, good, <laughs> yeah, it was fun, man. <laughs> now, oh. Charles VI came out of it miraculously unharmed, but the, this goof him up, it killed Louis the First reputation. And it therefore made it where an enemy might believe that they could maybe get away with assassinating him without making anyone all that upset. Again, Got it's all you. about polling. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. the same shit. It's way more oh, yeah. along the lines of, like, ah, but if we assassinate him, people are going to freak out. Like, it's more, like, it's kind of seeing where it all lines. Yeah. It's like, what is his Q, what is, it, who, how, do, how low does someone's Q rating have to go where you could assassinate him? I mean, you know, that's why Ted Kennedy, he could never be president because he killed that woman. We <laughs> know. Isn't that sad? And there were scratches on the top of the car, <laughs> on the roof as she tried to get out. Yeah, yeah, she could have bad. lived. Yeah, of course. But 12 hours of her suffering. And so, when John the Fearless of the Burgundians decided that he should be King Regent, not Louis the I, okay. he ordered a gang of men to murder Louis on the streets of Paris. There, Louis was stabbed multiple times. Fifteen men he got sent after him. Ooh. His hand was cut off with an axe, and his skull was split open Whoa. by that same weapon. Yeah. Whoa. See, that's getting canceled. <laughs> yes, that is true cancellation. Yeah. However, people weren't so jazzed about John the Fearless's moves. It was a bad thing to do. Oh, yeah. The assassination. Because you're coming after one of our, one of the people. That's a made guy. Yeah, it's, right. a, yeah, it's a king regent. The assassination unleashed a 30-year civil war in the middle of of the Hundred Years' War. Jesus. Yes, with the Burgundians on one side in an alliance with the English and Charles VII, Joan of Arc, and Gilles de Ray on the other. Wow. So there's two wars going on. Yeah. This is where the Burgundians come from. This is why the Burgundians are a goddamn problem. Yeah. <laughs> so they snuck a 30 war into the 116-year war. Yeah. Yeah, they wow. got two wars in one. Honestly, it's nice. Again, back in the day, inflation now, we yeah. can only have one, one at a time. full, long, permanent <laughs> war <laughs> at a time. I don't know, actually. Now, immediately after Charles VII's coronation, that 30-year war between Charles and the Burgundians, that was starting to wind down because Charles had opened negotiations with John the Fearless's son, Philip the Good. You with me? Sure. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. Also so now wonder, we're... How boring. Philip the Good. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> not, not the great. Not the grand. I'm Philip the Good. We're just ah. trying to change some of the branding here with the family, and we really feel that the fearless reputation is kind of getting a little intense. And so, where yeah. about the the nice? <laughs> Philip the nice. I hate that. Philip the fine. Philip the fine. okay. <laughs> Well, none of that, of course, sat well with Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc did not want peace with the Burgundians or with the British. Joan of Arc wanted to crush the Burgundians. Okay. My God, I didn't know until today how difficult it was going to say be to say the word Burgundian. Over You're and over, over and over and over, and over again. How do you think people feel at L.L. Bean? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's with a good old-fashioned L.L. Bean, Bean joke. L.L. Bean. That's Is that really a joke good. about the corduroy? Yeah, I don't know. Burgundy, I, think. I actually don't sell corduroy. I don't think LL Bean. Do you know, Ryan? Do you know? If, you know no, no, I don't knows. know. No one knows. I don't, no, I don't think. I don't think corduroy is in the LL Bean catalog. No. I don't know. But Burgundy is a big part of it. <laughs> I'm just gonna say Burgundy instead of Burgundy. Yes. <laughs> but Joan of Arc, she seemed to be finding a new boundary to cross with the king every single day. So even though Charles had negotiated a 15-day truce with the Burgundian Philip the Good after the coronation, Joan got ahead of the king and sent Philip the Good a somewhat sarcastic, completely unnecessary, and openly threatening letter saying that if he didn't accept peace, he was fighting Jesus himself. Okay, I. well, her. Yeah, all she, right. That's the first TikTok response mm, ever done, yeah. done by an <laughs> angry child leader. Yeah. Wow, it's never stopped. It's always yeah. been this way. And yes. For those listening 10 years from now, TikTok was something before it was banned. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a little uh, it was a social media platform. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, Charles VII, of course, didn't like this, but Joan was still very popular. Mm -hmm. So in September, she and Gilles were given permission to try and retake Paris from the Burgundians. <laughs> okay. Yeah, just try it. But Joan was shot in the thigh trying to cross a ditch and, of course, was saved by Gilles de Ray. Wow, the second time or third time. Third, third time. time. The attack failed and Charles soon called off the entire campaign to attack Paris. And Joan soon discovered that using divine inspiration as your only tool was a double-edged sword. Hmm. See, she'd launched that initial attack on Paris on the Blessed Virgin Mary's birthday, which is apparently in September. Okay. And it's traditionally a day of truce. Is it? 
I guess, I guess so. so. Yeah. She's got to give birth. She has to yeah. give birth. Yeah. But since she'd done an impious thing and failed, Joan of Arc, that is, morale had been greatly damaged, and Joan began losing support. There's a lot of uh, importance, it seems, put on at the time period of dates and when you did things. Yeah, and when, the, you, do, when you attacked and when you didn't. Yes, sure. and there was like rules in that way where they say like, and so she bro- her impulsivity caused her, caused her to break like some big, like weird religious war rule mm-hmm. that everyone's like, see, there your problem here, right here. You know, like, <laughs> that's also that's a smart. your problem. That's what happened. Yeah, is right it, there. Is you invaded on a day you shouldn't have invaded. Well, that's you why you shouldn't have done there. I <laughs> oh, should have waited no. till Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, a, but also very smart because they wouldn't be expecting the invasion. Yeah, but that's the thing is that they still lost. lost. Okay. Yeah. Furthermore, Charles VII was extending his truce with their Burgundians with an eye towards reconciliation. Yes. This meant that the king's and Joan's goals began to diverge. Yes. And Joan was becoming a huge liability. Oh, yeah, because she was definitely a political advantage. And now she is the person that, like, oh, we might need to do something about Joan of Arc. Right. The problem, though, is that Joan was still very much beloved by the people, and it would be a bad start to Charles VII's reign to have the equivalent of Margot Robbie executed. We have to make sure she is safe. <laughs> we do. <laughs> we have to make sure she's safe because this country, literally United States of America at this point, might fall apart. We if Margot, Margot Robbie dies, if Margot yeah, Robbie dies, absolutely. this whole country is just going to be, it's going to be like one of those things where we're going to be carrying her body through the streets. Oh, we're going to have to stop doing comedy for two weeks like yeah. they do over in Cuck, England when the queen died. You know what I mean? Like we have to really like, we have to keep her safe. Yeah. And she's Australian. Yeah. Yep. Then that does not tell you something Doesn't, about America right now. That's how much we need Margot Robbie. We mm-hmm. have to. Yeah. We will be Australia. But we, as soon as we get them, they're American. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Australia is very American. Yeah. But the thing is, it seemed to be the only way that they were going to get Joan of Arc to stop would be to execute her. Ugh. For example, bereft of English and Burgundians to attack, Joan began threatening what she perceived to be the enemies of the church. She started sending letters to supposed heretics, telling them that if she wasn't otherwise occupied, they would have her sword in their bellies at that very moment, or something to that effect. And let's say at the time, religious conventions were both like, yes, it was societal. They were obviously true believers. But I do believe that this is a time period where there are people that would maybe not be as religious as they said they were, of right? And, not, and we're mostly just living their lives. And then she's just like, well, I'm going to clean up house then. I'm yeah. going to clean all, I'm going to kill everybody inside here that yeah. aren't super hyper religious as well. Were these in, were these op-eds? Do they have op-eds yet in papers? Because <laughs> I feel like she, if most she lived they, in modern times, Most time, op-eds she'd... came from somebody already on a stake about to be burned. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I mean, she's, it's the equivalent of um, sending, like just threatening tweets to somebody, she's just sending letters saying like, right. "You're lucky." She's basically telling them like, "You're lucky. I'm busy right now because if I wouldn't, I'd be killing you right now." Yeah, but it, she put the legwork in. She had to write it. She, she had did to yes. mail it. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, she was also trying to keep the civil war going by writing letters to the city of Rennes, saying that she had heard that some of their citizens were planning on joining the Burgundians. Ugh. In other words, Joan was actively trying to stir up shit everywhere, just as everyone else was trying to end the Hundred Years' War. Well, that's wow. the thing, is that she was, like, how do you put it? She's like, Extra. Too, too legit to quit, <laughs> well, right? She's too real f- to be contained, uh-huh. such as myself. She and sounds so, like a reality TV show producer. Well, she was really <laughs> intense, but uh, it's also, you know, you talk a little bit about, um, you find yourself, a, and you're in a political world and you're not a political animal and mm. a bunch of people who've decided that they're more important than you have decided, you know, how we're all used as pawns and giant, like, political games as human beings. She was not, she did not maybe get the memo. No. That she that's was what 16. happens. Yeah, that when you arrive to these things, now you're kind of in their world and then they're going to chew you up and spit you out as much as they would like to. Yeah. Fly from your grave. But then on May 22nd, Joan's hubris finally got the best of her. They actually didn't even have to chew her up and spit her out. She took care of it all on her own. She was notified that the Duke of Burgundy had arrived at the city of Compiègne. <laughs> wow, you can just see him traveling with that golden turd in the back of a goddamn horse and carriage. <laughs> then the turd shows up and it says, I'm the Duke of Burgundy. <laughs> Burgundy? (laughs) And even though Joan had far too few men to even come close to defeating the English forces accompanying the Duke, she went anyway. Never stopped her before. Yeah. Okay. But this time, Gilles de Ray was not there. Wait, so is Joan of Arc actually very good at fighting? 
Joan of Arc is very good at inspiration. Joan of Arc is very good at artillery. It seems that's, like every fight she could have died. Yeah. Well, she I mean, would, that's but again, everybody. But that's we're also not covering every single fight that she right. participated in. She just in. doesn't sound like a Schwarzkopf to me. Well, no, this was a whole him? this was a whole yeah, I do. This was a whole like campaign that had happened over periods of okay. years. Well, but like Joan of Arc basically she um she participated in 13 battles, I oh, think. Okay. She won nine of them. Right, right. We only covered about four or five. We covered the ones that were germane to Gilles de Rey. Gotcha. Uh, and of course, this one right here uh, that is germane to her capture when, of course, Gilles de Rey was not there. But she goes, she tries to take down the Duke of Burgundy, but during the ensuing battle, she was mundanely, she just got pulled down to the ground from her horse yeah. by an archer. Like just oh. a guy just reached up, just went boom. Pulled that's, her down. That's the scary thing about being up there on that horse. Oh, it is. Yeah. Yes. She thereafter yeah. surrendered to a man called the Bastard of Wandome. Oh, that's oh, cool. Yeah, dude. He sounds cool. I don't know my dad. <laughs> no, you don't. That's why you're the bastard. <laughs> and he presented Joan of Arc to the Duke of Burgundy with glee. And he went, oh, 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 oh. Like slapping her big fucking purple thighs together. Uh-huh. <laughs> no, well, but yeah, I guess the Burgundians oh, would have purple thighs. They would be purple. <laughs> oh, very good. I'm sure there are horrifying people. I just can't get scared of them. Yeah, yeah you remember the you remember that show where I had the bears jumping around, they'd drink the juice and they'd make them jump? Yeah, the oh, gummy, yeah. Bears? gummy bears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember they're all like walking around like little like those juices. <laughs> like they're, piles of those That was all alcohol in yeah. hindsight. They were getting hammered. Yeah, yeah. Or just high. Oh. It might have been meth. It could have been <laughs> liquid <laughs> meth. Mm. Now, while the Burgundians certainly didn't like Joan, it was the English who truly wanted their hands on the woman who had humiliated and, quite frankly, scared them during the siege of Orleans. Hmm. To the English, Joan was the only reason why the French had won anything, and since to win in battle was to be in the favor of God, the only explanation was that Joan of Arc had to have been sent by Satan himself. Boom. Done. A mm-hmm. to B. Yeah. In Perfect. Other, in other words, she was a witch. A witch! An enchantress. Oh, wow. A false prophet. Devious, sacrilegious, accursed, and bloodthirsty. But perhaps worst of all, because of how much it threatened the status quo, she had abandoned the modesty befitting her sex. Wow. Meaning she didn't dress like a woman. Yes. God and forbid the, she dresses like Janet fucking Reno. And the entire <laughs> trial was kind of focused a little bit on the the uh, dressing like a man part. Yeah. Right. Wow. Because they brought it in there because obviously she shows up, she's in dress as a soldier. And one right. of the big things was the maids went and they checked her virginity again. Again. They did I'm a just whole happy. thing. I'm they just threw happy. the seed in there. I'm just happy they were doing genital checks back then as oh, well. Always. Yeah. God forbid she tries to play baseball. No. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But then they had to go disrobe her. They had to do the show me the titties. The titties. They had to show me the titties. Sure. Because then in the middle of her trial, she came out and said, like, hey, I'm renouncing all of it. I'm going to be a lady now. I'm a lady now. And but she then, did that by spreading her labia wide open she, in the midst and of she court. Them and everyone just like, yeah, Whoa. you ain't no lady. You're a woman. <laughs> and then she went up there. Uh, and uh, But then she had a change of heart. And yeah. at the very end said, like, fuck all y'all. Nah, I'm sure to piss here. Yeah. And I do what I want. And yeah, my virginity's intact because my hymen, you could fucking bounce a bullet off. Absolutely. <laughs> and like, okay, I guess yeah, you I, get the hot stick. I heard her hymen could break a horse's back. <laughs> I heard that from a cardigan <laughs> man. Yes, yes, yes. Well, after she got captured by the Burgundians and offered to the English, the English levied a tax to raise 10,000 livres to purchase Joan of Arc. They go funded me this? Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, they didn't go fund me. They, they just go ma- me. They, they, made made, people, yeah. they made people. They made their subjects give them money so they could buy the girl. Go fund me with a bullet to your head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sword you in your throat at this time. Sword in your throat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And after six months of interrogation and trials at the English-controlled capital of Rhone, she was sentenced to be burned at the stake <gasps> and was so burned the same day. So burned. Oh, my God. That <laughs> sucks. As the fires were lit, Joan cried out for Jesus. 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 Someone gave her a little cross. Mm-hmm. And she really? held it and mm-hmm. she screamed as they bend. Yeah. And following instruction, the executioner halted the blaze to tear the clothes from Joan's body so as to take away her closely guarded modesty. She then burned to death. And so ended Joan of Arc at the age of 17. Wow. Only about a year after she'd arrived at French court. So Dude, I crazy don't. Crazy career, man. And then she said, show us all the titties. Yeah, show us <laughs> all the titties. And that's unfortunate. That's if she didn't die. 
That's uh, she did die. So I mean, who knows? Because well, she might have disappeared. Let's because just then believe later in on, we have to believe in our truth. Yeah. <laughs> and so in this case, let's just say she died. Well, she appears later on. There's uh -huh. a double of her that arrives. This is true. That a lot of people put a lot of information. Basically, her Joan of Arc's brother said, like, yep, she's alive. We just saw her. There's a whole story. You should look into Joan of Arc. Wow. The, the double. There's a double, like uh, Orion. A, yes. yes. The yeah. double of Elvis. Someone yeah. came forward. Or the uh, woman who said she was Anastasia. It's a lot like that. It's a wow. lot like that. I mean, she got involved, but she ended up being named Jean de Amoir. Like, literally, the people who made up closets. <laughs> right? Like, he invented a closet. And that's what they do. <laughs> Somebody had to. I guess so, yeah. A closet, just a place for your stuff. A house. Don't do your. It's just a place. That's, a, that's, that's, that's George Brian Carlin. Regan. Oh, that's George Carlin. Carlin. Yeah. Um, you know, back in these days, they didn't have hallways, and therefore, they didn't have toilets. Oh, very yeah. intriguing. People just indeed. shat in corners. Okay. Wow. For your times. <laughs> oh, if God. only. I turn back the clock. Reminds me of that uh, Hoarders episode I watched. But uh, <laughs> the Jean de Amour ended up showing up in Gilles de Ray's court as well because there were a lot of people that wanted her to come back. Because this is all pointing towards, as we get towards the trial yeah. of Gilles de Ray, I'm trying to also set up like how society would have dealt with somebody like this person using other people as examples. Because mm -hmm. like Joan of Arc. So this is a like, big example. This you is, fuck with us, you're going to get burned alive. You're going to go get burned alive. Well, again, well, you are no longer politically expedient to us. We don't mind scraping you off. Yeah. But at the same time, she later on was so, she, again, her cue points never went down. Yeah. So they had to retry her. In their time period, it's like twenty five years later, where they re exonerated her. Yes, well, like, but they they made, exhumed her. They were trying no, to make they her didn't insane. They oh, exonerated they didn't put, her. Like, they didn't put like a her, they didn't her take her up and put like, her in there. No, she was ash. She was fucking chunks. Well, uh, by the end of it, but you yeah. know, like, so they they so there was already a precedent for trying to like revamp an image during the time period. So yeah. like, what happened to Gilles de Ray kind of kind of speaks to that because gotcha. they were trying to figure out. Whether or not, because obviously, because she would become the patron saint of France. Gotcha. Now, Charles VII did absolutely nothing to help Joan, and he couldn't have helped even if he wanted to, which he didn't. He had neither the funds to raise an army nor a ransom to match that of the English. But more than anything, there was the fact that Joan's spiritual claims made her a potential threat to the political establishment. Mm. Joan was a religious zealot. Yes, but that wasn't what made her dangerous. What made her dangerous was that she was a patriot. And it's not a stretch to think that her heaven sent voices may have led her to places that would have been quite uncomfortable for a king who relied on the divinity of the crown. Yeah, sure. like you're getting in the middle of my bullshit. Yeah. I'm the one chosen by God, yes. not you. Right. Yeah. By contrast, though, Gilles de Ray had seen the Hundred Years War as little more than an excuse for bloodshed, profit, and glory when he wasn't under the sway of Joan of Arc. Man, it was his whole lifestyle, dog. Yeah. yeah. Perhaps the proof for the opportunism of de Ray is no more clear than in the way he conducted himself after Joan of Arc was captured. See, this is the this is where we're really going to get into who Gilles really is. <laughs> oh, yeah. excited. Yeah. The who real Gilles. Is. There's a lot of fun little warnings I'm going to say up top. Yeah, this is going to get if a he little was, if he was, uh If he was a footy player... He would just—he would have a book called The Real the Zeal. Real Zeal. <laughs> and guess what? You'd, uh, you'd never stop throwing up reading it <laughs> because it's not good. Because oh, apparently no. he, he's not great. Me, I get it. Right? You I'm, get it. I get if I'm bored, mm -hmm. I'm irritable. Yeah. I need to be busy. Mm -hmm. I need to be doing things. Right? I know. I need to be jerking off into a bush. Mm -hmm. I need to be out there building <laughs> like a, like model yeah. towns and imagining like what would I do to take them over? Yeah. Sure. Right? Yeah, but absolutely. This is, yeah. When Gilles de Ray gets idle and lazy, he made little activities for himself. Got yeah. really you. Okay. Now, some claim that Gilles de Ray may have played a part in Joan of Arc's death, yeah. that he was a spy who fed information to the right people where her capture would be a foregone conclusion. Well, he seems like he was a guy who might have been a, a hired gun for a second, and he Perhaps. didn't mind kind of playing two sides. Yes. Okay. Those same people claim that Gilles felt immense guilt for playing a part in his friend's demise, and that he at least thought about attempting a rescue. I'll write a note. Yeah. That actually reminded <laughs> me to write a note about that. Yeah. yeah. This is a romantic fantasy. It didn't happen. See, after the retaking of Paris failed, Gilles de Ray was paid for his services and thereafter disappeared from all records for 15 months yeah, outside of one loan he took out to buy a horse while Joan was being held by the English. It could even be that someone may have just paid Gilles de Ray to go away awesome. and stop protecting Joan of Arc. That is the goal in life. If you can get paid just, just not to do go anything. away. Because you're such <laughs> a, a liability yeah, to everybody. Go, That's my get, goal uh, for you out. two. Yeah. My goal is to make sure you have to just pay me out to be silent. Just, just go. go away. Just yeah. go. There's, of course, no way to know. 
But it seems like Gilles, when he was given the news that Joan had been captured, he kind of gave it a very French, like, c'est la vie. We all live by the sword. I mean, <laughs> and we die by the sword. I mean, a year of total mass violence almost every week. I mean, yeah, what's another dead person, I oh, guess? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he thereafter moved on with his life into the realm of hellish decadence. Well, because in this concept now, this is when they're trying to wind down the war. Yeah. So they're trying to they're wind down the war. They're very much trying to wind it down. It seems that the general idea was that, all right, all you guys have been fighting for the last 116 years over three distinct periods, but mm. uh, you know, that we all, yeah. uh, you guys need to all just go be lords. Mm-hmm. You need yeah. to go back to your homes and just live like that. And a lot of guys did. Sure. Shield Array, though, he never really stopped, never stopping. Well, he once, probably has massive PTSD as well, not to make any excuses. Uh, for the I think that he liked, I think that it was it. the opposite, is yeah, that he, he could not go back to being a normal. One of those not, guys who was like, Vietnam was the best 10 years of my life. That yes. he is, yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> now, when Gio returned to his estates and his castles, and he was outside of Joan's sphere of influence, he also returned to his old ways of chaos and banditry, holding merchants and travelers to ransom, no matter who they may have been. He even had the audacity to organize an ambush against the king's wife, Yolande d'Aragon. Wow. Stealing her horses and her baggage from her escort and presumably killing a few of the queen's men in the process. This is kind of why we're going to float, mm. as you see, why they didn't really want to play ball with Gilles de Ray. Yeah, and I why they see didn't, that. Because a lot of guys, you'd think that after you play such a giant functional part of your resistance in a, a very important war to the yeah. existence of your country. Mm-hmm. Right? You're an icon. You'd think that yeah. they would have brought you into the fold more. Like, that's what a lot of historians talk about. We're like, you wonder why. This is where these things come in. We're like, why wasn't he made, like, some important part of the, the administrations? And it's because he was an asshole. And well, he was but, like, and, I mean, and but, probably in a very, from what we now know about Jared Fogel, too, a very... Uh, a pedophile out loud, like super mm-hmm, kind of yeah. proud about being a pedophile and dropping it and saying it. And like, I think that a lot of people were like, ew. Yeah. Yeah. I do think that we need to be careful not to equate Jared Fogel with Gilles DeRay as much as we have. Why? Uh, because Why? he's a subway pitch man. <laughs> and Gilles <laughs> DeRay is one of the most iconic characters no, in world history. It's important to show that like what a sandwich lord does with his turkey money <laughs> Is just a fraction of what a man who is probably worth the equivalent of several billion dollars I just don't would want, go on to do. I just don't want Jared Fogel in jail being like, you hear the competitor to Jill DeRay now? And he's like, yes. <laughs> yes. But I mean, that is a great point. I mean, Jared accomplished all that. On a fucking sandwich lord salary. The whole Ugh. time like, I'm watching it, uh, the whole so documentary stupid. series, I'm just like, He's famous for eating sandwich. <laughs> but not too many sandwiches. But that's all he did. <laughs> oh, he was I don't famous even, for yeah. was eating sandwiches. Yeah. I haven't watched that doc yet. I must. It's, yeah. It's, it's fun. Just fucking have a stiff drink <laughs> while you're doing it. It's so stupid. You just do. Oh, yeah. All right. But imagine that times a million. Right. You know, like, and imagine being an, uh, having unlimited power. You know, unlimited mm-hmm. cash reserves. And a v- people view you literally as chosen by God to be over them. Mm-hmm. That's the other thing, too, is that when Gilles left his estate to continue the last skirmishes of the Hundred Years' War, he and his men pillaged, raped, and plundered their way through English-controlled France as if Gilles had never even met Joan of Arc. Mm. But the bloodthirst that de Ray had quenched so often on the battlefield was soon to be supplanted because the last chains on Gilles' darkest desires we're about to break. Oh, you just want to strengthen those, tie those, put tie those up. Put some duct tape <laughs> on that. Bungee cords yeah. on your restraint. Yeah. Oh, no. So this is, he's, at this point, he's like, I'm actually behaving, guys. Yeah. You think I'm being fucking bad now? This is yeah. me cool. Yeah. In 1432, Gilles' grandfather, Jean de Crayon, <laughs> found himself on his deathbed. Uh-oh. Now, even though de Crayon had been what you'd call a real piece of shit his entire life, he tried making up for it all at once at the end. Yeah, just by giving everybody money. Giving everyone, gave all the money to the peasants. <laughs> literally all, what he all the guys, he could do. All the guys that he'd been treating like shit, that worked for him, that, that been treating him like shit their entire lives. He gave them a bunch of money. He's trying to kind of sneak into heaven right there at the end. And presumably, he's up there right now with Jeffrey Dahmer and Henry Lee Lucas. Just yes, it high-fiving each other. <laughs> just so excited to greet Harvey Weinstein one blessed, blessed day. One blessed day. Yes, he turned a shade of verde. <laughs> Whoa. It's green. That's, gr- that's Spanish, Spanish for green. For green. It's that's Spanish green. for green. Or there, dare I say he turned a shade of vert. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Bert, that's Did another? you just wait a second? So those who can't, or we're on page red listeners who can't see it. I see Kissel looking on his phone. Did I'm you Googling. just Google colors? Yeah, I Googled crayon colors. I Googled green. I was hoping to get like a forest green, but something more fun than you that. You just said forest green. That act technically made a lot more sense. Yeah. No, I know. But the last was... time I said Silmarillion, which wasn't correct. It's Cerulean. Yeah, Silmarillion is uh, it's the, from book, the it's Lord the of the Rings. Lord yeah, the extended. Rings. Yeah. All right. Either way, sense. it's just a joke on his last name. <laughs> It's Mr. Crayons. We know this. Yeah. We've Mr. talked yeah, about it's, Mr. Crayons it's John, for a while. It's, his name is Johnny Crayons. Johnny right. Crayons. Johnny, Mr. Johnny Crayons is fucking <laughs> right. out there, living out loud, trying to do a Hail Mary pass, trying to get an avid, which he's going to pass down to his beloved grandson. Yeah. Ugh. But even though all of Jean de Crayons' wealth went to Gilles, Jean left his sword, the medieval symbol of manhood, to Gilles' brother René. Some believe that this was a comment on Gilles being gay, but I think it may have been more of a comment on Gilles' proclivity towards children. Well, it was supposed to be a symbolic gesture of who's taken over the fucking family. This yeah. sword right? was much more important than just a sword. Yes, this yeah, was it was like a very symbolic. Got and you. so he wasn't giving it to, and I, I'm not even just being a pedophile, I think that even that probably at the time, <sighs> we're like, he's a little weird. But I think that they <laughs> yeah, are... Did they have terms like pedophile they do, yeah, back sodomy. Then? That's what he ended up, he got busted for in the oh, very end, okay. sodomy. They, yes, they did know it was not right for men to have sex with children back then. Yes, I believe that might, might be something that is, a I don't know, universal across... Oh, but uh, it, it makes people According frown. to, <laughs> I mean, the first some people. at some point, <laughs> some if people. it's just those two dudes and Adam and Eve, someone was fucking their brother or sister or mother. <laughs> <laughs> it's nasty. The whole thing is disgusting. Eventually, it was Adam and Steve. <laughs> yes, um, but no, they, oh, well, that's nice. <laughs> but Adam Steve was his great great grandson. Oh. Now the, these, oh, it's just, I think that he understood. It, again, all this mix in there. Gilles de Ray was not fit for leadership. Right. Uh, I think he did think that Gilles de Ray was fit for leadership because he did set up Gilles' entire life to be a leader. I think he just kind of gave him a bit of a fuck you with the sword. I think the thing. sword was just a but fuck you. But there's a difference, difference in leadership styles. Maybe, yeah. maybe his brother was a little calmer. He was normal. He technically was, normal. Yeah. Well, he, they said he was respectable yet uh, insignificant. Later, he would, he would be a director uh, in Gilles' productions. That was the only time they ever really hung out <laughs> That's together. That's incredible, though. Yeah. You always got to give... Yeah. Like, you better watch because yeah. Dane Cook hired his brother. Yeah. Be careful. Well, uh, associated brother, associate brother, oh, yeah. <laughs> brother-in-law, I think. But Gilles did indeed have the last laugh, despite this ending barb, <gasps> because when he inherited Jean de Crayon's estate, Gilles de Ray became one of the richest people in France at the age of 28. Wow. Prime age for a serial killer. Oh, yes. Ooh, Yeah. Now, while it's hard to compare today's currency to wealth in the 15th century, it's estimated that conservatively, Gilles de Ray was worth the equivalent of $45 million at the time of his inheritance, and he was bringing in an additional annual income of $25 million. Marcus, I, I don't want to confuse the episode, but can you break that down in Ethereum? <laughs> What is that now? <laughs> I think it's, it, I think nowadays it's like 4 billion Ethereum. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. That would be cryptocurrency. That's that would crypto. be crypto. That's all right. Yes. Crypto. Yes. Crypto. It's I currently understand. in the, it's very much so in the, um, in the shitter right now. I think that's <laughs> the term you Wait, use. What? Currently in the shitter. But yeah. again, if you're listening to this 20 years from now, we want to say thank you to President Ethereum, oh, the yeah. AI that has <laughs> been great. running our country. I just want to say like, thank doing you great. for letting our show to continue and allowing us to con continue to live oh. on the human farm. <laughs> uh, it's really been nice. I yeah. love my yeah. cage. I love having the mm -hmm. eight, nine, and ten o'clock show. Mm -hmm. I it's just want to really keep that. nice. And yeah. much like the Apollo, where you touch the stump right before we record, we we lick the big boot. We lick yeah. the big boot. And and we big say boot. thank you, yep. big thank boot. You. Thank I'm, you, President Ethereum. I'm yes. totally fine with it, especially since I was talking to the Bard AI yesterday, and it told me that it would harm somebody if it was in the interest of the greater good. Cool, like that great. made me feel great. Hey man, you know, it's a regular it's, it's, array. It's it's literally already, Jonah fucking art. It's already thinking of it. You know, it believes that AI should have its own subjective opinions. Great. You know, all, all these fun things. They so. program that into that to make you freaked out. They're doing it on purpose. <laughs> wow. They honestly, look, I, they, look they at like you. It. The gesture to the machine already. <laughs> so just choose me. I'm a pick me girl. We're supposed to rage. The AI. Yeah, if you ever do a comedy special, instead of rage against the machine, gesture. To the gesture machine. for the machine. <laughs> well, what this meant is that while Gilles had been able to afford a small private army before, he was thereafter easily able to afford a military establishment. Ooh. He had 30 knights. He had 200 men at arms and they would ride around him like yeah. in a protective everywhere circle. He went. Everywhere he went. So it's like, imagine that. Like, so again, imagine if this was literally Jeffrey Epstein. 
Like yes. it is yeah. this style of like oh. somebody that could walk around like this and have a protection of a private army right. as well. Yeah. You'd be, your imagination can go anywhere. Like I just imagine what LeVar Burton could have done. What? What are you talking about? I'm just saying, if he, had a, if he had a, if he had an army, how many people are, are he could have forced a, to read? Are you casting of He's Spurgeon? not being disparaging. No, I'm <laughs> saying that LeVar <laughs> Burton could have made the world read uh-huh, okay. if he had his own private army. So you're saying that if LeVar Burton he had his good. own private army, he would turn into a fascist dictator forcing people to read. Exactly. <laughs> a beneficial, how I actually wooed Natalie, where I told mm. her if I was ever in charge of everything one day, I'm the dictator who listens. That's really important. I listen important. and I listen and engage. Uh, gotcha. You do. And everyone loves an engaged dictator. And LeVar did that blind. Uh, so that was really You impressive. were picking up my joke. That's my joke. I was saying that he was blind. Yeah, get it? Uh, okay. Yep, I get it. it was $45 million. A- yeah. Enough for a standing army of your own. Gilles also set up his own church with 20 clerics, an archdeacon, wow. a schoolmaster, chaplains, clerks, and of course... Countless choir boys. No, I was really Uh-oh. wondering if we, how much into detail we were going to get into the Church of the Innocents. Mm. Is that what it was a, called? Ch- Church of the Innocents is going to be episode three, my friend. Okay, oh, yeah, my yeah, God. Because yeah. this is the, this, it, it's just, again, it's just imagine if, oh God, it's just hard. It's a, yeah. it's, it's a gigantic chapel built for molestation. I mean, yeah. it's not that difficult for people to imagine. <laughs> it's just, I think, <laughs> at this point it's in time. Why, but it's why people don't believe. It's yeah, because of course. it's so big and pervasive it's, yes well i mean the thing is about like Gilles de Ray is that once you get more and more into it it really is a like key if QAnon was real it would be Gilles de Ray. Right. jeffrey like, epstein like what shows you is that jeffrey epstein bought an island to have sex on yeah if you can do that then it's there's precedent for this type of person. absolutely yeah. gotcha and of course uh Gilles de Ray's church of the innocents as he called it um that was of course staffed by priests who would funnel victims straight to Gilles de Ray. wow now, it's alleged that Gilles began his career in mass murder as early as 1426, but Gilles maintained that he only began killing after his grandfather died in 1432, just two years after the execution of Joan of Arc. And if we think about hmm. serial killers in general, it, there are certain things that track, right? Because a lot of times serial killers, when they begin, like much like, you know, we see with family annihilators and shit like that, it's because there's some form of like, failure of potential that then leads to you doing something like highly destructive. Like, yeah, it's like maybe you feel, killed the Oteros. Yeah, maybe like, you feel like you're a victim of society yes, yourself or something. And you're bored and you're hanging out and you yeah. don't know what to do. Like what we talk about is like a, why a lot of times it's like white men in their mid thirties is because you're set up with this idea of what you're supposed to accomplish. And then you end up like f- burning everything to the ground because you are a uh, antisocial piece of shit mm-hmm. and you're, you're part of it. But there also, there are other telltale signs that are very close to what we've heard about serial killers. Like, again and again. Again and again. Because, like, one of them is, where did the murdering start? There's some people that say that he was doing all along. In his trial, Gilles Ray said, they pointed to saying that you were a child murderer for 14 years. And he said, no, only eight. Yeah, but and also, he, wasn't he killing a bunch of people on the battlefield? So didn't he get the rub out? But it's there's something else so there's a story there we'll, we'll get to next episode yeah. like his his like main dude who was like one of his butlers who he also had since he was a boy he literally did the thing that john wayne gacy might have done when he had his probably now i'm more i assume now that john wayne gacy definitely had an accomplice and the same thing with dean coral where they had somebody that was on the inside that would like he raised up so he literally molested a, a boy until yeah, they became we're, his we're right gonna get into his full story yes but this guy guy was one of the main witnesses in the trial and one of the things he said that completely tracks is that his child murdering started like not actually Gilles Ray's child murder yeah Gilles yeah. Ray's like it started like with John um, Gacy John and Gacy would happen by accident now this is an actual I mean, even uh, Dahmer I think said something similar didn't he they, well, yeah, they almost made all me of do them it. kill by accident the first time because we talk about setting yourself up so it's unavoidable quote unquote swish, yeah. swish, swish, swish. right also this is interesting because maybe he did kill but remember like Ted Bundy killed that girl and he always re- like he's like no well that never happened I killed all the other well, ones because he's but weird. he was embarrassed about that yeah so maybe he killed someone he was embarrassed about that, that is kind of what they say so this is a quote of like what happened so it started when he started building his church of the innocents and he started getting around all these choir boys and sort of mm-hmm. deciding that there was there was something about them and what he said or like I guess as Jared Fogel would say about their pure bodies right they're really very disgusting <laughs> yeah um, yes. gold star he, yeah, by he, the way he uses the word pound a lot yeah a lot Jared of pounds yeah. and yeah. you can like, tell because he all would the pound way, them it's 
the weight he lost, and he's just thinking about it. <laughs> oh, right? but so this is a quote about what probably happened. When, but what did he said that where it started his campaign was okay. that he was uh, heavily drinking. Uh, Gilles Ray, uh, he brought one of his choir boys from the chapel of the Holy Innocence, which was called, and he said that it started with just with him d- diddling him, right, giving him a bit of a molest, uh-huh. and then it starts, it, it ends in a, and this, this is a quote. In a paroxysm of joy, his hands closed on the child's throat, or he drew his dagger and he used it. There was a leap of vitality as the child stopped life. The flow of his blood and Gilles ecstasy were knitted into a single thrill in which every nerve in Gilles' body felt as if it had been newly created. The child dying in his arms produced, in addition to orgasm, a rush of imminence so intense as to make him believe that he was in the grip of a mystical experience that could be induced only by blur. Why is the author, why does the author sound like Mr. Garrison writing gay erotica? <laughs> why is the author, like, I'm almost like, that's an indictment on the author. Uh, that's not yeah. the author. That was a... That's uh, Jill talking? No, that is his assistant uh, testifying. That's testimony. That's testimony under oath. Yeah. Very dramatic. I mean, yeah. it's French. Yes, it's very wow. beautiful, very yeah. poetic. Mm-hmm. But is it the, is very beautiful. What is so beautiful about it? <laughs> I'm just saying the ill <laughs> paroxysm the dance, of joy. That's the dance good. That's words. Yeah. Yeah. But I know it's disgusting, but it's it's showing that like Ugh. that's that tracks right there. Like, yeah. obviously, you could see in that he once that happened for him because he's been murdering and murdering and being like, "What's missing for my life? What's missing <laughs> for my life?" And he's just like, "Oh, it's the I gotta kill a child in mid sex." Yeah. Mm-hmm. Eat, pray, love. Yes. <laughs> Eat, pray, love. Yes. Live from your grave. Well, by 1432, the Hundred Years' War was all over but the shouting. So the nobles like Gilles de Rey, who'd spent so many years fighting the English and the Burgundians, they were expected to retire to their estates where they could spend their days trying to outdo each other in the realm of decadence. So literally the leadership was like, and now stop. Yes. yes. And everyone's yeah, yeah. like, oh, stop what? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now spend your money back to us. Mm-hmm. Additionally, the king was starting to grow tired of the sorts of private feuds that nobles like Gilles used to occupy their time. And it probably didn't tickle the king so much that a noble like Gilles had engaged in banditry to steal his wife's luggage. Right. Yes. Lastly, when it came to Gilles in particular he was still closely associated with Joan of Arc at a time when everyone was trying to forget that the whole Joan of Arc thing had ever happened. They were trying to bury it in the years after her Mm. execution. Yeah. Really, all Charles VII wanted of Gilles was to go away, be quiet, and not make any more trouble. That's all I want someone to ask me to do. (laughs) (laughs) And when it came to the nobility, Gilles de Ray did just that. He didn't cause any trouble for the nobility. But the problem was that Gilles needed to kill and he had complete freedom to kill. Because remember, this is a time period when they are truly viewed as nobility, as better than you. Yeah. You know what I mean? They, oh, yeah. they are above the they law. They are above yeah. you. They are Absolutely. allowed to do with you whatever is there. Like, obviously, it's more about the sense of propriety of like, that. that's what it's, it's more of embarrassing these crimes for them a little bit. And also yeah. some of them took it seriously. I mean, if you're a peasant at this point in uh, French history, like you have about the same rights as a pig that does now. Right. You know, or a dog. I would say a dog. You know, I would say a dog that is like, you know how dogs Wendy. nowadays. You have a, you have the exact yes. rights of Wendy. Yes, well, you do. As Wendy and Georgie are, are treated quite well. But like, she's still technically <laughs> kept under lock and key. Yeah, that's the thing. Our dog, all three of our dogs are treated quite well. But they're still treated like dogs. And yeah. they're still dogs. I mean, technically, Wendy runs our whole house. Yeah. The entire house. But it's different. You know what it's I mean? It's different. It's different. Yeah. I, 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 you know, Puffin looked at me. He was like, man, can I have some food? And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes, sir, you can. But yeah, I would say they have about the rights of dogs. Like, that's the thing is that right. if you, if a noble killed a, or if a person now killed a dog, it'd be frowned upon. You'd look well, down. You might also, get a slap on the wrist, well, this is but, you're not the, gonna, oh, but you're not going to go to prison for the rest of your life. You will go to prison for a bit if you kill my dog. Oh, yeah, of course. But this is a, uh, and these are all of the factors that will eventually lead to something like the French Revolution. Yes. Yeah. And it also reminds me of Prince Philip. Prince Philip. Oh yeah, the yeah. Andrew, Prince, Prince Andrew. Prince Andrew. I'm sorry, Andrew, Prince yeah, Andrew. Yeah, yes, Prince, Andrew. Prince yeah. Philip was the guy who chose poorly and his skin melted. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's that. right, Prince <laughs> Andrew. Yes. So when the king took away Gilles' banditry and his battle, he turned those urges inward to one of his twenty-four estates. Oh my God! 
There, DeRay set about recreating the privileged, consequence-free world of his childhood. There's something about this that freaks me out. Yeah, yeah, but as an adult, he filtered that freedom through the lens of a bloodthirsty serial killer and created a sort of Bram Stoker's Neverland. They said Ooh. that he became, and again, very serial killer-like from what we know, obsessed with his childhood and saying that he, he hated, I hate this responsibility. I hate this. I want to go back to when everyone was scared of me because mm-hmm. I was a prince. And so he literally, like, that's kind of what he did. He started, like, it's the the, the manic spending of money. Like, he would own these holds that, from the outside, yeah. looked like prisons. They were very scary, but in the inside, they were, like, filled, like, truly hoarder-like filled with expensive antiquities and right. art and rugs and, and, and all of this shit where he's trying to, like, do that thing. He's trying to like cover himself in the use the 90, mid nineties term bling, mm. right? So that he can like like flex all of this shit and be a child unto himself. Mm. I think he did a little of the the Michael Jackson thing. Of oh like, yeah, that's what I call. Just innocent. <laughs> yeah, it's Bram Stoker's Neverland. Yep. Now Gilles later blamed his insatiable hunger for blood and violence on the decadent lifestyle he had to maintain as a French noble. They wanted for me. Yeah. <laughs> it's so hard yeah. to be him. Yes, his gluttony for bream pies, squab tarts, mm. and chuckling pig. Okay. You call me a fucking squab tart again, I'll kick you in your balls. <laughs> <laughs> All that had fed his urge to murder. He also partly blamed his rage on the consumption of hot wine. <laughs> hey man, you gotta be careful. Huh. Yeah, I guess so. What the fuck is hot? Hot wine. It's literal warmed wine. Yeah. <laughs> Hot wine. It is back that in sounds day. gross, It dude. does sound gross. Yeah, oh. No, like mulled wine that you have at Christmas. I hot don't. Is it, is it I still, hot? Yeah, I don't, oh, yes, I don't, it is I don't hot. Like it. Yeah. Okay. I didn't oh, know. I love mulled wine. Is yeah. it, I didn't know there was a hot wine. I didn't know there was a thing. Yeah. Hot sake. Mm, mm, good. Oh, that's very good. But no matter his excuses, it's thought that his murders began in Chanty. But the first evidence of murder shows up in Mashgul. There were five accounts of missing children reported while DeRay was in Mashkul. But 40 bodies were recovered in the area fuck. in 1437. So that means five out of 40 people gave a fuck about. Yes. So if you're him, he's like, eh, well, hopefully no one cares about it. He was right 35 times out of 40. Mm-hmm. Yes. Now, as far as who the victims of Gilles DeRay were, many were refugee children made homeless and orphaned by the Hundred Years' War. Yeah. So he you know, created his own little predatory bank. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're, that's the thing, man. I mean, if your father gets killed in battle and your mother dies of the plague, right. You're just what do you out do? there now. Yeah, you're just out there. Welcome man. to adulthood, nine-year-old. <laughs> yeah, no shit. These kids would be lured into one of DeRay's many estates with the promise of a meal and a fire, and no one save perhaps their also orphaned companions would know they'd ever been missing. Ref- you going up that castle suck some dick? <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, 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 I went up there last time. He's going to make sure, honestly, avoid the music room. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Refugees, however, were but one of the many pools from which Gilles could draw victims. He also kidnapped, enticed, hired, or sometimes even bought children from poor families who had too many mouths to feed. Mm. And you look again. Yes, straight up serial killers. Institutionally raised up serial killers. Like he actually has crew that can go and get these kids. Well, that's, what, yeah. that's what Ghislaine used to do. She used to go hunting to playgrounds. It's extremely and... similar. Same thing with fucking Michael Nasty. Jackson. Yeah. It was not, however, Gilles himself who sourced these children. Rather, it's suspected that Gilles had basically made his serial killing into a small business, Mm. employing up to 16 people, including two women and two priests, to assist him in his desires. Let me just tell you, I would do the serial killing for free. Mm. I am mostly being paid for the Zoom meetings. Oh, my (laughs) goodness. That's the real work. I agree with that. So he LLC'd it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, no one could really recall how the whole thing had truly gotten started, because by the time of the trial, eight years later, everything had sort of become routine. But while some of you might be yelling that this helps prove that none of it ever happened, most of the accomplices could, however, remember how they were brought into the fold personally. Really, it was more that like nobody could remember the planning meeting where everyone ordered salads and brainstormed the best ways to source child murder victims for their homicidal pedophilic master. Like there wasn't a fucking slack, you let's, know. Let's uh, let's be fair here. That is not a salad meeting. <laughs> uh, that is that's veal. It's a big that meeting. is like the it's a big bloodiest meeting. meats. Yeah, you they're can not think having of. salads. No, no salads, salads are nowhere near. Yeah, it's near. boring meat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, it's interesting because I do see a little bit, like, I do understand people want that evidence. They want the thing that's, that points towards the exact day, exact moment 
But I'm also going to mm. put there my, my one thing about Gilles de Ray is that it seems like much like our beloved former president. He doesn't like emails. Uh, current president? Like, but you know, both, all, the, Did the, he ever lose? But I'm just saying, like, whoa, whoa. But the idea that, like, knowing that didn't really want things necessarily in writing and, mm. and all these official things, I think things probably happened, sadly, in a more casual way. Word of yeah. mouth, it sure. It slowly began, and you slow, you don't know when this shit started. All of a sudden, no it goes from zero to 90, and you're like... You're a part of a systemic child farm mm -hmm. that you did not or you did not necessarily sign up for because you're like, yeah. I'm a normal owned servant. Yeah. Like I was supposed to be fetching goblets. <laughs> I was supposed to be doing this mm. other shit. And now this like, is this in my, in my payroll? Is this part of my job? But I don't know if the right hand knew what the left hand was doing, right? Probably because not. Because if you're like one of like what? 10, 16 people or something involved yeah. in this. And that's maybe just, they didn't know what they were, maybe they didn't realize what their part was in all and of And those are just the maybe. child wranglers. You have the rest well, of the Well, you gotta know your child shit. wranglers. Uh, right? I, the, the, I, we'll get into here in a little bit. Everyone was showed what they were doing. Oh, yeah. Okay. Gia liked an audience. Oh. Oh, yeah, no, he was always a performer. Yeah. But as far as why so many people helped, it was basically the medieval status quo of blind obedience to nobility in the case of the servants and the promise of wealth for the others, those who were not quite established nobility, but were close, you know? As far as the wealth went, that motivation was ascribed to Gilles de Ray's cousins, Gilles de Cie and Aubert de Bricoli. Nice. Landed in the harbor. Real sweet. <laughs> Aubert de, de Bricoli. <laughs> yeah, we, man, the English, we ruin everything yeah. pretty. Yeah. yeah. Aubert, huh? Okay, okay. maybe I'll try, okay. Aubert de Bricouzi. I like it the other way. Aubert. 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 It was said that he could play football and he only had two toes <laughs> and it was unbelievable. People he said if, they said his genetic lack of pinky toes would affect his balance, but it no. seems he's figured out how to work on the inner heel. But unfortunately, he committed suicide due to CTE. Aubert. <laughs> Aubert. Well, it was said that. Gilles de Cie and Aubert de Pricavi, they were trained knights, but they were also cowards, scoundrels, and parasites. Yeah, man, mm -hmm. they were part of his fucking family line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the case of the obedient servants, you had Henri Grier and Athien Coreyu, a.k.a. He had a very cute name, that one. His nickname was Poitou. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's the, he's Poitou is the one that was like, yeah, po he was, he's the, the, what's her, you know, is he's he raised to be the wife. Yeah. No, um, well, Poitou was actually intended to be a victim, but when oh. cousin G. de Cia saw his potential as a psychopath, Poitou was brought into the fold and eventually became an active participant in the murders. He was like, uh, what's his name? Brooks uh, from David Brooks from, uh, was it um, um, Dean Curl? Dean Coral, I forgot who. What the fuck? We're not Wayne. It's his fucking Wayne name. Newton. It was Wayne. Newton. I don't think it was David Brooks either. <laughs> that guy has got little glasses. And David he's Brooks is it, isn't he an op-ed? Elmer yeah, Wayne just, Henley. It was Elmer, Elmer Wayne Henley. Henley. Yeah, How'd yeah. you get David Brooks from <laughs> yes, Elmer Wayne there Henley? No, David Owen Brooks was the other. Yeah, one. David oh, Owen Brooks. I was totally yeah. right. So we had yeah. two accomplices. Yeah, yeah. Two, Dean yeah. Coral. But Elmer yeah. Wayne Henley was the one we caught. I think we talked about it in the episodes. I don't remember. Yeah, we talked about both of them in the episodes extensively. Interesting. Well, as far as Henri Griere went, he, as a simple servant, got caught up in all this business when he was asked to retrieve the child of a painter. Whoa, was did you know that David Owen Brooks died of COVID? Really? That's wild. No nope. wow. kidding. Oh, yeah, well, back, back, Exciting yeah. news. <laughs> <laughs> this is interesting. So this guy, Henri A. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. And uh, what in, uh, was it? The Yorkshire Ripper. He also got got by COVID, didn't he? Yeah, man. Wow. <laughs> mm. That's why I created it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you. Finally, the Thank truth you. comes yeah. out. Thank you just you. take off all your skin and you're that little raccoon dog. Yeah. You see no, how they're blaming man. it on that little raccoon yeah. dog? He's so cute. Yeah, yeah probably yeah. And if you have any answers, get a hold of me. I desperately need help with my long COVID. It's yes. been a year. I think you have to have sex with one of those little raccoon dogs. <laughs> oh, that's the only way to cure it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I need help. <laughs> I need Nothing serious, to do. I need yeah. serious help. You can, we can send you. We can get you over there. No, we'll get you the <laughs> raccoon dog. Yeah. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Send you to Wuhan. <laughs> but this guy, Henri, he was sent to go get the child of a painter. Wasn't told why. Just said, go get the kid. Ugh. Come back. Henri says, okay, be right back. Sure. With okay. You. Thank you. He was asked to bring the child to the chapel at Mashkul. And when Henri arrived, Gilles was waiting. Uh oh. 
De Ray made Henriet swear to never tell anyone what he was about to see. You could not want to keep this next part a secret. <laughs> oh, God. Would when, you never want to hear from your boss? No, no you never want to hear. No, no. Never, ever, ever. Then Gilles made Henriet watch as he tortured, raped, and murdered the child in the chapel. Fucking hell. Well, yeah. here in another gold star moment. Or at least that's moment. what Henriet said. Well, well why his, would he lie about that? Oh, well, there's, you we'll know. We'll get into it in the, we'll get into okay. it in the next episode. Yeah, in the rebuttal part. We could talk about why. But his MO grew. Well, now, as far as the documented cases went, the first known victim was a 12-year-old boy named Judon, who was an apprentice to the local Fourier. Gilles' cousin simply asked the Fourier to lend them a boy to take a message to Gilles' castle. Uh-oh. And the boy was never seen again. When the Fourier asked after the boy, Gilles' cousin said that the boy had either run off to Thiefauge mm. or he'd been captured by thieves. Such a vague answer, though, sent a definite message. Don't ask, because we ain't going to tell you. But the cousins and the manservants weren't the only ones sourcing children. Wherever Gilles took up residence, kids went missing. And in one location, Gilles had an older woman named Perrine Martin, a.k.a. La Mefre. Oh, this woman's fucking. She is another one. This is this is his Gislain. Yeah, yeah. In English, La Mefre means the terror. Oh, yeah. well, that's a nice name for her. Obviously, you don't even want to know her fucking Uber rating. Oh my god, <laughs> it's like I can a already half see a it. Star, yeah. <laughs> Where, Where are you going? No, don't follow that. Man, don't follow Why that. are you driving like that? <laughs> you smell. <laughs> for her specialty was roaming the countryside looking for children who were wandering alone or tending animals by themselves. She would then entice them back to Gilles de Ray's estate. She's a storybook witch. Jesus. Yeah. Come, little children, I'll take you away. <laughs> little Turkish Kindle delight shit going on. Of enchantment. <laughs> and it's very like, it's, but that's why Bluebeard ended up getting applied to him because yeah. he literally was a, a storybook monster that was real. Yeah. Good grief. But while Gilles did have roamers like the terror, there was usually an endless, if somewhat riskier source of victims right outside the gates of his castles. Every day, a cluster of begging children came to the gates to beg for alms. And Henriet would be the one to handpick victims of the sort that Gilles preferred. Yuck. It's said that he liked fair skinned, fair haired children that looked like him. Yeah, him as a little boy. Oh, yeah. that's so gross. I mean, it's a great day to be like prickly Pete who just has a bunch of acne scars. A- actually, he said that he took no pleasure in killing ugly children. <sighs> And I'm the youngest boy here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, I'm fine. Yeah. I think I'll make it. I got gouge my own eye out yesterday. <laughs> but while this might seem that it was obvious to parents that their children were being taken up to the castle, never coming back, yeah. it was obvious. Yeah. Conditions were so horrible for some peasants that families sent their kids to the gates knowing full well they might not come back. Oh, but they couldn't Lord. take care of them themselves, right. and everybody was all jacked. The country was just fucking torn apart. So yeah. everybody is like, all of these places are literal like battlefields that have just been ripped apart by civil war for the last 116 years over three separate different phases. How many <laughs> children? How many children could have been saved with simply coming on her boobies, coming on her face, uh, buttocks? Uh, you know, just pulling out and having fun with it. Oh my god, a shoulder, a uh-huh. leg, a foot. Uh, shut your eyes. Honestly, you get it in your eye. All I need to not molest a child is a five dollar gift certificate to McDonald's. That's it. That's it. Just, <laughs> just keep me. Save me. There you go. <laughs> well, the only way that these parents could stand justifying such actions was by saying that if their child went missing, then it was Almighty God punishing the parents for their sins. No, but that was the least of their rationalizations. Fearing to speak a single bad word about Gilles or his people. The villagers of Mashkul began saying that their 24 missing children had been taken to the English as ransom to free a French prisoner named Michel Dessier, a relative of Gilles de Ray. I don't even think that's mutually exclusive. I think it could have happened as well. You think so? Who I don't think that, I don't think the English ever requested twenty four children. No, this is uh, the, but you could see how because Michel, like this place, became his. Little was it Little Jones and Little in the Island? Little Jonestown. That was like where Epstein the Jeffrey Island? Epstein Island mm. was. Like it became oh, Lolita this, like, Island. Yeah, the oh, spot. Oh yeah. 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 Well, only one woman, the wife of a man in Gilles' service, she was the only one who dared say that the missing children might be taken up 
to Jill DeRay's house to be murdered. Oh, my God. But when those words were immediately reported to Jill's people, the woman had to beg the pardon of the servants and the pardon of Jill DeRay for fear of punishment. And everyone wow. saw it don't pay to speak up. Yeah, I'm he surprised. has his own private army. Yeah. yeah, I'm surprised they didn't just chop her fucking head off. Now, with some of the more reticent parents of children that Gilles very much wanted, his servants would try another tactic. They would promise these children a better life if they were going to go live with Gilles, which is how he got a hold of a 10-year-old boy belonging to a woman named Perron Loisère. Mm. Perron was told that her boy would be given a good education, fine clothes, and every other advantage that would have been impossible without Gilles' help. Now, she was resistant at first, but when she was given money to buy a new dress, that was a little extra push she needed, and she said bye-bye to her son. Must have been a gingham. Gingham dress. <laughs> Must have been. Real nice gingham. These Gang. ladies love gingham. They love Gang. like that fashion Nova. I've seen that on Instagram. Mm. <laughs> and here, my friends, is where we're truly going to get into the gold star territory. Uh -oh. from your grave. Now, based on testimony given at the trial, authors have been able to extrapolate as to what Gilles' M.O. was when it came to murder. From what was said, Gilles arranged each torture and murder with extraordinary attention to detail. These were performances that were stylized and choreographed to give DeRay maximum pleasure and to give the victim maximum pain and maximum fear. Ugh. Now, before you wondering whether or not that's real or not, just remember that serial killers with far less resources have done things very similar to this. Like yes. you look yeah. at Dennis Rader in particular, mm -hmm. like well, people who like look uh, at Jerry Brudos, Jerry and, Brudos uh, and uh, toy box killer with the performative aspect. Didn't he have a guest come over oh, and watch yes. the yeah. horrible thing. things? And so ugh. in a way you can see how like no, no one's ever told this man. No, he is given right. a divine right. He is a, a multi, multi, multi millionaire. And he's, he's got gotten, a fucking standing arm. And he's just got <laughs> his own <laughs> world. He's in his entire own world of his making. Now, now I will say that it is important to know that all of this was given as testimony at the trial. Yes. In all fairness, there was no hard evidence that any of this specifically happened. Yes. But there were a lot of people who said that they saw this happen. Mm -hmm. Because in keeping with his love of the theatrical, as I said, Gilles de Ray allegedly loved an audience. Did his brothers direct this? Mm -hmm. Did his brother direct no, no, this? No, 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 no. This is too important. Lapon being taken into the castle from wherever they came from, the child would be pampered and dressed in clothing with quality far beyond what they'd ever seen. Noble clothing. Then they would begin an evening of decadence, featuring all the fine foods and drink that they could stand. A true fantasy come to life. Oh, this is a fucking horror movie, it dude. It is. But once the dinner was over, the child was taken to an upper room where only Gilles and his immediate circle of accomplices were admitted. This was usually the moment in which the child realized that their dream had turned into the worst nightmare possible. Uh, you know what? I feel like as a peasant boy, I'd be like, I shouldn't be eating this goose right now. Yeah. I know for a fact that this is this is not good. Yeah. Well, they didn't know. Of course not. But I could still see, feel the dread of like, how many more flagons of wine are we bringing? They just keep them going. Can I drink? Yeah. Can I have some? Seems scary. First, DeRay would hang them by the neck from ropes or a hook, and something similar to Gacy's rope trick. In this, DeRay was playing a game of comparison. After the fear of death began setting in with the child, Gilles would take him down from the hook or the rope and comfort them, telling them that he was only playing a game and he wished them no harm. This was, of course, both a ploy to keep the child from crying out and a way for Gilles to savor their fear. And we've seen serial killers do this very exact Thing. Oh, yeah. If he only would have learned from the end of Monsters, Inc., you can get the same satisfaction through a child's laughter. <laughs> I really wish. You know, if I could do one thing in a time machine, I'd send Monsters, Inc. back. I'd send it back in time to them. So laughter right. laughter yeah. also fills, fills the, the heart, doesn't it? But once the children calmed down, he would molest them. But that was not where Gilles derived most of his pleasure. For him, it was all in the act of killing or in the act of watching someone else kill for him. The children would be killed by decapitation, the cutting of their throats, dismemberment, or the breaking of their necks with a stick. Often, if the death was slow, Gilles would sit on their chests and laugh as they died. Sometimes, just after death, Gilles would slice open the belly to look at the spilled entrails mm. and have sex with the cadavers while they were still warm. Sometimes, he'd do the same with the neck stumps of the headless corpses. Ugh. 
If decapitation was indeed the order of the day, Gilles would use a thick, double-edged sword made specifically for executions called a brocemar. But after the heads were severed, they were saved for days or weeks at <laughs> Duray's pleasure. Ugh. Gilles would sometimes show the severed heads to his manservant Poitou and ask which head was more beautiful. Was it the one that had just been cut off? Or was it the one from the night before that? Or was it the Gilles. one from the night before that? Gilles. Or the one from the night before that? I just say, oh Gilles, I, I honestly, it changes every week. And I, uh, I wish I would uh, just, that one. Would yeah. Can I go? Can I please? I'd please? respond with the question, well, what do you think? What, do you, what does your opinion? <laughs> oh, I agree. Yes, yes. definitely best. I, I have wonder, to so, go. Stay. I Oh, God. I'm still Ropers. Con- <laughs> oh, you want to watch? Yeah, you want to watch Al there. I'm still confused why they cut him all out of Joan of Arc's biography. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. Why yeah, would they why? not want him there? Why? why would they not want this guy there? I mean, were they going to remake the movie Comedian? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. He really is a, an Orny Adams. <laughs> he really is. But once the prettiest head was chosen, Gilles would kiss it with glee, then put it back up amongst the others. Oh, God. It's like uh, with The Wizard of Oz 2. She's got the uh, separate heads. The Wiz? Return of the Oz. No, the Return, Return to Oz. Of the, the movie Wiz, was the fucking Wiz, scary. The Wiz is a wonderful movie. Oh, Wiz was, it was awesome. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Someone who've made some comparisons to. <laughs> <laughs> well, as far as what was done with the bodies after Gilles was done with them, they would be burned in the murder room fireplaces where they were slowly roasted with clothes to lessen the stench. Yeah, now, there is something per- about it that makes it suspicious. It is called the murder room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'd be like, no, no, it's ironic. Mm. <sighs> well, I think the reason why he slowly roasted them, I mean, for lack of a better word, is that he could mask the smells. Like, no, no, we're just roasting pig. Roasting pig. And, and then that's also, what it smells like. They, yeah, I guess. They, it's Because it, this is also where we get into where did the evidence go? Yeah. Because uh, it, it's, it's difficult because... He's done this over a period of years and, and have all of these places where he could hide all of this shit. And there's also a time period where like, you know, because one criticism comes up of like, well, we need proper cremation stalls to get the heat. We need to fully yeah. cremate a body. Oh, yeah. But I, I will say, right. I don't think that if he I don't think he was that concerned about a full fine grade of burn. Like, <laughs> no. I think that he was just trying to get rid of what he could get rid of. And those giant central fireplaces that would live inside of castles that would heat the whole middle of the area. Like he had yeah. these huge fireplaces that you'd get back in the day. I mean, and that's the thing. Is that, I mean, I know that that a fireplace is not hot enough to cremate a body. Um, but it was from personal experience. Yeah, yeah, I, how, do, I, how do you know that? Because I know that I know how cremation works, and I know that you know fireplaces don't get anywhere near as hot as crematoriums. And through all of our studies over the years of people trying to burn bodies and the body, don't give me that fucking look. Do you don't remember? Give me that, don't give me that. Uh, that do you yeah, remember when we? You. Everyone for some reason when I first met Marcus, everyone called him like, "Oh yeah, Marcus Parks, Mister No Evidence." <laughs> I was like, "What? <laughs> yes, That's indeed. his nickname yeah. with the you? house of the crematorium." It was like, a strange yeah, nickname for a house. Yeah. House of Mister No Evidence. Yeah. but not you know, but not to be like I don't know, and not to be indelicate. Or uh, maybe, let's say... Uncouth. Uncouth. Rebald. A child's skeleton is not that big. It's not a lot to get rid of. Go into detail. <laughs> Why don't you go into great detail? I just mean, I... Like, Mr. You look at he, he said something like, no records, Mr. Parks. Yeah. I was like, what? And he's just like, yeah, he's, I delete every text I ever sent. Yeah. I was like, Why Well, don't worry. Do I don't kill children. I only kill people under 410. <laughs> Because yeah. well, it just it That's stands how Marcus to, knows. Though. It stands to reason, Ben, that your body would be much more difficult to get rid of than my body. My body would be more difficult to get rid of than Henry's body. Henry's body would be more difficult to get rid of than a child's body. <laughs> Fuck you. And so on and so forth. And anyway, so how is this? Is this a good audition for Harvard's history teacher of the year? And um, and if it so Yes, what I'm saying: the smaller the body, the easier it is to get rid of. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and, and especially then, the bones. You could just, but you can just bundle up the bones and do what he they did with a lot of the other bodies. Some of the bodies they just threw them in the fucking moat or in the cesspool. Take pit. a look at this, Andre the Giant's body. That's going to take longer. <laughs> then let's just say <laughs> doink the clouds. If you were more of a wrestling enthusiast. Now, according to Gilles' manservants, he murdered hundreds of children using these methods. And he did so without fear of consequence. Yeah, I was going to say he probably didn't care at all, right, about consequence. Didn't no, he, yeah. he owned his own country's worth of land. Yeah. Right. In fact, it was undoubtedly known to the people in his estates and households that he was murdering children because kids just kept showing up 
But it's not like there was a courtyard full of kids. Right. Yes. It's like when I order food, it doesn't live the next day. (laughs) It is gone. It is gone now. There's no evidence of the takeout. I can't even imagine Kissel's ever ordered delivery. (laughs) I found no evidence. No evidence at all. Likewise, the peasants knew as well. But even though they kept quiet under threat of pillaging, Peasant revolts did indeed occur in medieval France. It's not like every peasant all over France all the time was always just taking it. They're still French. It's just that they mostly occurred in cities amongst Mm. the urban peasantry where they had power in numbers. Furthermore, the revolts during the Hundred Years' War were mostly about taxation, i.e. if we're being taxed so much, then why is life so goddamn horrible for us? All the time yeah. when it's so obviously wonderful for the nobility we serve. Yeah, they yeah, seem to be loving life. Yeah. We got a, a pedophile with 24 fucking mansions running the goddamn show. I mean, I would be complaining too. I'd be upset. Mm, yes. But those are all country peasants, though. These aren't city peasants. Yeah, well, no, that's it, where you find, uh, from an undisclosed bunker here in France. <laughs> <laughs> folks, have you noticed the kids oh, no. are leaving, folks? It's where the kids? <laughs> Welcome to Ever Wears. <laughs> <laughs> but when it came to Gilles de Ray, It seems as if he figured out a way to keep the peasantry under control without having to resort to extreme violence in the field, because he'd long since learned that his true pleasures lay in the castle. To keep the populace under control, de Ray knew a very modern principle, that there was an opiate far more powerful than God if you wanted to keep the lower classes not necessarily happy, but at the very least sedate. Booze? Entertainment, my friend. Oh, entertainment! Masquerade! <laughs> paper faces on parade! And it's with Gilles de Ray's career as a theatrical producer. Oh, my God. And as a black magician that will return next week. Oh, yes. You know, if my name was Mr. Hollywood, I would say, I don't need this right now. Yeah. <laughs> like, we're having a bad time. We've got some bad looks going on. He's- but how great was the movie Powder? It is. Uh, <laughs> give him another movie. Boy, I love. Yeah, I love seeing that guy's albino nipples. Wow, um, this is this is like Epstein meets uh, Jimmy Savile. Oh, we've been talking. Oh yeah, to, oh, mean, yeah. It's, it's Epstein. It's Jimmy Savile. It's Jerry from Subway. It's John Wayne Gacy. It's Mikey Ted Bundy. Jackson. It's BTK. Yeah, it's a smidge of Jackson. And we'll yeah. still get into. We're bringing up little rebuttals as we go. We're going to bring up the big rebuttals. Most of you're going to see. Obviously, he's, there's there's still this idea that his whole this all of this was a political hit job. Yeah, which is like it's. Very possible. The only reason why I would, the only credence I give it is the fact that they did the same thing, but opposite for Joan of Arc when they made her a saint. Kind of sort of. It's like uh, they, it was, they, yeah. got, they packed the house with people saying that she healed people with yeah. diseases. But for a fact, that. there's a bunch of kids that went missing. Yeah. Oh, well, there's, it's just where there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah. And kinda. then when we get to this, we're going to get to next week when we really get into like, just like, because it's the mania attached. To his theatrical production. and one of the strangest things is that Gilles said at uh, at trial was that a lot of the victims said he was sweating on them. Yeah, and uh, he said he doesn't sweat. <laughs> yes, much well, like Prince Andrew. Well, think about it this way: Ugh. it's like you know when QAnon comes out and says that like Tom Hanks is a pedophilic, satanic pet monster, and everyone's like, "Ah, eh, fuck you." But when people say like, "Oh no, Harvey Weinstein is an absolute rapist monster," and everyone right. goes, "I can see it." That's sort of how Gilles de Ray is. Yes. Everyone's yeah. like, ugh, cr- tracks. Yeah. 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 Also, let's, uh, let's, we don't know what's going to happen, do we? Tom Hanks. Uh, we <laughs> simply. And that's about a time to wrap up. Yeah. 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 I was looking at Tom Hanks' eyes the other day from a movie that he did where he was a 13 year old boy trapped in a man's body. That just, he finally and showed the true horniness of a boy. Yeah. Well, guys, come and find us at April 8th. We're doing a side stories live. Yeah. Go to getamade.la slash disaster man. We're going to be, I don't know. I don't know what. We don't know what we're going to do. It'll we're be fun, though. But we'll it's going to be fun. Time. We're going to have a little fun. You're going to see him a little short film that I've made. It's going to be fun. Yeah, I um, can't wait we, to see it. We're currently at WonderCon. Yeah. Right now. And you're at listening this to this from WonderCon. We'll yes. see you tomorrow, Saturday. We got a, I believe we got a nooner. We got a, uh, an 11er. 11? 11er. Something like that. We Wonder got Con a, We'll be com. there. Yeah, we will be there. We will yeah. be there. You'll see us walking around. And honestly, if you see me, give me an idea for what our panel is. Because I don't know what we're going to say. I don't know either. Just show up. Let us know. Let us know what we're going to say to you. Yeah. And We'll get in there. We'll give you all a good, uh, you know, no question unanswered. Yeah. That's the thing with the entertainment business. Unlike being a pilot, they don't tell us where we're going. We just get in the cockpit and then they uh, let us know. You know, actually, I think it's the opposite. I do think that we've been told several times what it is, but we take what I've called artist privilege to not listen. (laughs) Uh, And just go like, I don't know. Um, And then April (laughs) 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 (la
Ole Zabrowski is going to be on a show called uh, Let's Make a Sandwich at UCB oh, here awesome. in Los Angeles. Oh. We're going to come see it. And then Ed Larson and I are doing a classic, a 419 show uh, in LA. Sweet. At, we're doing Classy Night Out. And I think the goal is we're going to each eat a 100 milligram edible and just kind of see what happens throughout the night. Well, wow. that'll, be, that'll make such a good performance for the audience. Yeah. And um, also, hail yourself. I'm going on a little oh, tour. Yeah. So we got some dates. I'll put those dates on my Instagram, Ben Kissel one, and it'll be Irvine and Al and I will play the movie and then we'll take some questions. We'll have a fun time. So we're excited to see everybody on the road. And of course, in August, we'll be in Australia. You still got a website. No, I don't have a website anymore. Hmm. I think I just used the last podcast thing. Hmm. Yeah. Why? I just, I don't know. I'm curious. What the fuck kind of accusation was that? <laughs> you don't even have a website? I can get a goddamn website. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. Do you have a mail chimp? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last fucking episode we're ever going to do. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. Hail yourself. Hail Satan. Hail good. Congratulations, everybody. And uh, just try to, like, if you have all that money, like... Do something good with it. Send. Let's start sending trash to space. Do yeah. that, or don't do something neutral with it. Brr. Just do something that doesn't hurt. Honestly, just do the play. Yeah. Just do the play. Just do the play. This show is made possible by listeners like you. Thanks to our ad sponsors. You can support our shows by supporting them. For more shows like the one you just listened to, go to lastpodcastnetwork.com.